On the day she appeared, the world was terrorized. Not even the Sword Emperor himself could fight her head on. She was a monster like no other. But as the Sword Emperor had already achieved his goal, he asks her to kill him. So, in his final strike, he finally appears, a scarlet-haired swordsman who blocked that monstrous attack and leaped onto the Moon Fairy because today is the day she will be cut in half by the Swordsman Moonbreaker. And thus, the wave of dragon attacks was granted, and on that day, nine sword energy rays fell from the skies. Six years later, at Waryong Mansion, our little scarlet-haired one is taking a beating from the woman. She's saying that today they received important guests and he hasn't been cleaning the yard properly. So she says he's ignoring this order because she's not his mother, and that's why she says she's going to teach him a lesson today while his brothers laugh at the situation because he's so timid he gets beaten without fighting back. And now we're on the road with the guests who are going to meet their father's only sworn brother, Uncle Yun. And come to think of it, the woman is looking for her daughter who was actually sitting on top of the carriage. Inside the carriage, one of the sons is asking the father to tell more about Uncle Yun, and he starts recounting that old story from six years ago when Yun and his sword arts were the most perfect under the heavens, and if it weren't for Yun, he wouldn't be alive here today, since his technique of the nine celestial swords is capable of matching the most advanced ones from the Sword Emperor's clan. But then the son asks if it's so strong, why aren't they known to the world? And that's because Yun retired and didn't pass on the techniques to anyone, so he's going to tell them something important now. Uncle Yun had two wives and the one he loved the most was the second one, but unfortunately, she died after giving birth six years ago, and after that, he lost all reason to live, locking himself in the room where the second wife used to stay. And because of that when they are at Waryong Mansion, they shouldn't mention anything about the second wife. And now back at the mansion, the woman was still hitting the boy until a guard arrived saying that the master left the room as soon as he heard that the Nangong clan's carriage entered the village. And then the woman starts wiping her hands of blood, angry because he went out to see his sworn brother even though he didn't, no matter what she did. So the woman orders that boy to stay out of everyone's reach while they are receiving the guests because otherwise, trouble will arise again, and then she leaves with her other brothers happily while for him there was only misery, and she tells her eldest son that they met the daughter of Uncle Nangong and that's why he needs to treat her well. So, they finally arrived while Nan Gong was introducing his wife and children, but when they went to introduce the second daughter, she had already gone out for a walk. And now, the mansion's woman is approaching, saying that their fourth son also does a lot of this. And Yun was also introducing his wife and children. And the snake's name is Baek Minju. And so they're inviting everyone inside, while she asks Munbeek to look for their daughter in the mansion. As all of this was happening, our young Scarlet was in the most isolated corner in a punishment position, wondering when the guests would leave because his arms were already hurting. He was hungry and tired too, and that's when he collapsed on the floor. Until some time later, someone comes close, and when he sees that shadow, he immediately starts apologizing, thinking the woman came to beat him again. But when he opened his eyes, it wasn't that woman but a girl, who was probably the guest's daughter who went out for a walk. Meanwhile, at the mansion, they were having dinner, asking if they wanted to unite the families with a marriage. But Young just says he appreciates the offer and that it's better for his children to answer for themselves, as parents shouldn't choose their children's marriage, something that happened to him himself to marry the ugly one, a marriage of convenience. And she's probably pissed about it because she's dying to marry her eldest son to their daughter. So now she says she wants to ask a favor for the Nangong clan to train her son Munbeek. And Yun says the same thing, he would also like to ask for this favor, but then the leader of the Nangong clan asks if he's okay with it since the eldest son won't inherit the nine celestial swords, and that's because he can't pass on these martial arts at his age anymore. And there's also another reason he was going to talk about later, because he ended up fainting in the middle of the dinner table. Now we're with Munbeek, who is still looking for their daughter, until he hears something over there, and it was his sister sucking up to the guy's son there, and she was all saying he killed all his enemies. But then Munbeek shows up there apologizing for her bothering him, and in the end, they both ended up fighting while the other thinks it would be nice if his sister were as lively, but then he apologizes again, and they go look for their sister together, the same one who just found our scarlet boy, until he remembers there would be important guests, so if his mother finds out about this, he's screwed, and that's why he bolted out running, but the girl just grabbed and pulled him back while he kept apologizing thinking he was going to get beaten again, and she herself wondering seeing all those bruises, they don't seem like the result of training, and he was skinny too, and by the red hair, he must be the swordsman's son from this man mansion, so she lowered her hand coming up while he was desperate with fear. And that's when she understood that he never received proper care. And then she just ran her hand through his hair, asking what his name is. And the name of our scarlet boy is Yun Jika, the fourth son of the swordsman Yun. Then she says she'll protect him while he cries with happiness. And then she took his hand 
and they escaped from the mansion through a hole, and so we ended up in the village that was nearby. Then she bought some skewers, and they were eating while back at the mansion. The sword emperor is saying he was shocked by how he ended up in that state. But Yun said he already told him that the advanced technique of his clan is passed down by Zhou Tian Xuanu, the Chinese goddess of war, but now he can't see her anymore since the day his second wife died. And with her death, there was a baby identical to him, but he didn't have the courage to see him even though he knows her death wasn't his fault. And so he wants to ask Chief Nangong one last favor, even though he has no right to say this, he hopes he'll take care of his children, as they are poor children who grew up without a father. And so the guards are finally arriving because they found the young lady who arrived holding hands with Jeek. And then the other one acted like a concerned mother, as later on, they will be in trouble while the young lady was eyeing her with contempt. Then the other brothers also arrived, while the eldest of the Nangong was surprised that she was holding hands with this child, and Munbeek too because he lost the brunette today, and so they had to part ways. And the woman was furious, and probably after that, all hell broke loose, but in the seventh month of that year, Lord Yun Moriong died in his sleep. And as soon as he died, Minju summoned dozens of warriors from her clan to fill his absence in the clan, and the warriors she summoned became known as the White Tiger Squadron. And besides that, Nubik had gone to train at the Nangong clan, while Minju assumed the position of the mansion's official master. And after the guy kicked the bucket, she searched all over the mansion to see if Lord Yun had left his martial arts manuals, but there was nothing, so she ordered everything of his to be thrown into the warehouse, and when they were taking the things, they were supposed to lock that brat inside too. And our Scarlet Boy ended up locked inside that warehouse where his father's things were, and when the doors closed, that room became a dark and silent void where he ended up sleeping out of fear. And the next day, the only thing he received through a small opening was a plate of water and a potato, so he ate that while he saw something shining on the other side. And then he went to take a look, and when he removed the cloth covering it, there was a large foggy mirror back there, and he ran his hand over it and saw his own reflection, only it wasn't really his reflection because it started moving inside the mirror. And after that, time passed, and winter came while the guards were saying they would soon have to dispose of his corpse, but that mirror was still there moving inside, and he himself said he was no longer afraid of it, in fact, he didn't even have the strength to be afraid because he was about to die of cold. Then the mirror picked up a wooden stick and began to make strange movements, and the more he did that, it seemed like martial arts movements, the same ones he saw his brother's training. So he remembered that the teacher told his brother that if he learned this, he would be able to circulate core energy to create young energy and create and maintain it, and the first step of the nine celestial arts. And then he remembered that his brother could create warm air even in winter with this, so he grabbed a piece of wood to do the same as the mirror. And so he tried, fell, and the mirror laughed, but he kept going, kept going until he finally succeeded. He no longer felt cold and was able to create warm air just by following the mirror's movements, and if he kept it up, he'd survive. So now the mirror is showing him to continue, but for him, it was already good at that level. And then the mirror began showing other great movements as if it were teaching him the nine celestial arts, but he had no interest in martial arts, yet the mirror persisted mocking him for saying so. Then he took the wooden stick and said he could do it too, and so he continued through winter, summer, spring, and he continued following the mirror's steps, and even when he tried to give up, he rose again and continued, and he also realized that the movements of the nine celestial arts that it showed before had similar patterns to those of the clan, but much more difficult. So this could be an even more advanced martial art than the one his brother practiced, and thus the mirror showed him some writing up there saying that this was the true mirror of the Jotian fairy, the one that disappeared for his father, and at that moment, the 900 words that were inside the mirror appeared up there and flowed into his head. And it was here that he realized that the true art he was following was the technique of the Inquisitor's Sword of the Heavens, and so the one who spent his whole life being abused was thrown into a warehouse, but this misfortune helped him find the mirror that would change his life. So a child who was supposed to be killed began to undergo changes, and the secret manual that was not passed down was indeed slowly passed by that mirror, and because he was stuck in that warehouse, he focused all his strength on learning what the mirror showed. And so, 10 years had already passed, and he finally managed to do exactly the same movements as the mirror, and now at the mansion, Mubik had just arrived after 10 years of training, and Minju rushed to see him, along with her other two brothers, and who was also there were the descendants of the Nangong clan, Misyun who looked more beautiful, and Chu, the eldest. Then in the middle of the conversation, Miss Yun ends up leaving again like that time, and Minju tells the guards not to let her near the warehouse, and actually there's something about the warehouse that the guard wanted to talk about because he checked last night and Master Jeek disappeared, so the woman got furious, and actually what happened inside the warehouse was that he finally managed to do the movements, but now the mirror points upwards where there was a crack, and finally, 
After spending 10 years in darkness, he would see the sky for the first time, and the mirror confirms that today is the day of his departure, and in this way, he ascends upwards, and when he looks down, the mirror had already disappeared. So the time has finally come, and at that moment, Minju is going to the warehouse and realizes that he escaped through the hole, but she tells the guards that it is not necessary to bother looking for that brat. And meanwhile, he is there in the city seeing all those people for the first time. Back at the mansion, she lies to Mubi that Jiak has been missing for three days, and even after sending people after him, they haven't been able to find him yet, and the young lady overheard everything, so she thought, it's been three days since he fled, but the blankets and the furniture in his room were new, there was no trace that a human lived here, and she just left Minju talking to herself while even Mubik asks if there really wasn't something more to it because he had never seen his sister disciple act like that, as she is known as the charming mind reader, so there must be a reason for her to have run off like that. And so Mubik arrived at the warehouse where the young lady had already realized what happened, she had kept Jiak imprisoned inside the warehouse, and so she says she will inform her father about this, and she will already be returning with her brother. Meanwhile, Jiak is walking through the city until he comes across one of the mansion guards, and he starts walking to the other side, but the guard stops him to check his identity, and that's when he runs through the city until he finds the exit in front. So he ran and the guard went after him, but when the gates were closing, the guard appeared behind, but even so, he managed to dodge and continued until the closing gate would crush both of them, and at that moment the scarlet boy held that giant gate with just one hand, and after seeing this strength, the guard was scared shitless and said it was just a joke. So he left, and our boy finally escaped from his imprisonment 10 years later, and now the story of this monster who will become the strongest in this world will finally begin. After escaping the city, our scarlet boy ended up in the middle of a forest starving, and even though he knew it's dangerous to eat random things on the mountain, he saw a mushroom that looked very tasty, and so he took two bites, and when night fell his stomach was hurting, his vision blurred, and his head spinning, and that's how he ended up passing out in the middle of the mountain. The next day, two guys were passing by who saw him almost dead on the ground, but at least he was breathing, so the one with long hair said they'll take him since this is the first time he's in encountered someone worse off than them, and according to the other, they already have six members but they won't go bankrupt if they add one more. And after a while, he was dreaming about the fairy until that same long-haired guy wakes up and asks why he passed out in the middle of the mountain. And the scarlet boy thanks him and takes the opportunity to ask where they are. This is actually the hideout of Mount Wufeng, and they are all bandits. This bald guy is the second eldest brother, Taco, the long-haired one is the third, Ma Hyung, the one with the mustache is the fourth, and the big-haired one with the sash is the patriarch, Peng Yun. And according to him, they saved his life, and Jeek must repay that from now on, meaning he needs to learn to work seriously to help them. Then the one with the mustache says he's being too harsh on a kid and offers him a potato to eat, and seeing that scene, he even refuses, saying he's not hungry, but his stomach keeps growling. But they say they won't ask for money from him, while the other one is thinking he talks as if he were a child even though he looks like he's 15. The second brother comes saying they can give him secondary tasks since he seems like a good kid, so the eldest grabs him by the clothes because he's going to show how things work, and outside he's all trembling, asking not to be beaten because he's traumatized by Minju, but the other says it's not related because they're going to collect vegetables. And the scarlet boy says he's not fit to be a bandit since he's not strong, but the first brother says that in this world, there are two types of people, those who take things from others and those who lose things, and which side he wants to be on, but he still didn't understand. Then he asks if he really wants to continue living hungry and being called a bum, the scarlet boy doesn't want that, he doesn't want to lose to anyone, and that's why if he could choose he wants to be the one who takes things from others, and so the mentality was set, and the boss tells him to look back, and from the first peak to the fifth are their territories, they rule Mount Wufeng, and no one can ignore them here, and if he becomes part of their family, he will also be a ruler of these lands, and that's how he was proclaimed as the seventh brother of the family. And now there's another important thing he needs to learn, so the first brother starts shouting that they are the best, and Jeek should shout too. At that moment, our scarlet boy felt excited for the first time since his birth. Now nothing else mattered, all the dark past as they say turned into the past, since his newfound longing for life awakened his key of the nine heavens, and so he shouted with all his might that they are indeed the best, a scream that released all his pain that he had kept inside, because now this is a milestone for the new beginning of the scarlet boy, and so now he will learn household chores with the sixth brother before learning martial arts, and thus, Jeek's life in the mountains began. He learned how to survive and was able to adapt to this new life. It was a perfect daily life, but of course, not every day was tranquil. Why the bandits of Mount Wufeng were from common families and didn't have a high level of martial arts. However, even returning injured, 
they make the most of the little things of everyday life. And so, Jeek, who lived a torturous life after becoming a bandit, felt happiness for the first time. Then, one day, the first brother and the others were kneeling to these two guys who are part of the bandits guild, which was a guild created a long time ago to impose fear, but what happened was the opposite. Until one day, a monstrous man appeared in this guild, the experts from the seven sects and days schools joined forces to defeat him, but no one returned to tell the tale. And so, his fame spread throughout the world, being known as the demonic lord who devastates the heavens, and as a result, several martial world experts came hoping to join the bandits guild. And after accepting renowned individuals, the bandits guild became one of the most powerful in the whole world. And that's exactly why everyone was kneeling, they wanted to be part of the bandits guild. But the guys say that a bunch of vagabonds like them don't have enough qualifications to carry the guild's flag, and the boss said he'll arrange for three more members, only it actually needs four because this is just a kid, since for him to join it would be up to ten people. But his friend calls him to talk a little bit, because in reality, they'll need to accept these guys since in half a month their boss will be checking the hideout, and if they don't meet the target they're screwed. And they don't need to worry because even if they accept these guys here, in this area there are large merchant groups, and so they'll end up being killed anyway, and that way they'll be able to reach their goal and won't worry about weaklings. So they come back saying they accept them into the bandits guild, and that they should have at least 10 members before winter, and that way the bandits of Mount Wolfing celebrated because the merchant groups paid tolls to the bandits, but what they didn't know is that nearby they are strong so they just hope everyone disappears before two months pass. However, their expectations were wrong, and so on another day, the Scarlet Boy was sweeping the door while his brothers went out to work, and now, unlike before, he also wanted to go with them. And this way a month passed, two months, until three months later he was so used to the tasks that he finished quickly and had nothing else to do. So he decided that now he would review what he learned in the warehouse, so that one day he could go with his brothers through the mountains. And so, the next day, the boss said that these people volunteered to be part of Mount Wolfham. So the first one steps forward, he and Lee Chul, who fled after hitting the magistrate's son in the region, this is Chun who wants to lessen his family's burden, and this is Han Chai, who was 19 years old and was sold by her father to a brothel, so she ran away from there and decided to live in the mountains. Meanwhile, the second brother is telling Jeek that now he won't need to do household chores anymore, so he'll be able to join the trips through the mountains, and the thin mustache said he knew he was practicing in secret because he wanted to go with them on the trip. And so the family ranking was decided in the order in which you became a member, but the big guy asks if he had talent, could he rise in rank? But according to the boss, they're from the bandits guild, so the strongest stays ahead if he defeats the one above, and he's happy to know because he had three years of experience in the military. In the end, he chose the seventh who seemed to be a bit dim-witted, so he wants to be above him. Then, our scarlet boy says he'll fight him for his position, and so the fight will begin, the big guy versus Gioka, and the other brothers were proud of him for not being afraid. And then the fight started, the big guy came with a punch, but Jeek dodged it and as he had no weapon, he ended up in the air and just took a punch in the face. And now even the brothers were thinking of stopping because he knew nothing about fighting, but then he, angry that he was getting beaten up, got up and punched the big guy in the face, who just buried him in the ground. But when he seemed to have one, Jeek got up saying he would never give up his position, and the big guy is wondering how he managed to get up after that beating. And so he went up again, but now Jeek had the idea to think that his fist is like a blade, so now it was just a punch in the stomach that made the big guy fall to the ground unconscious, and that's how the Scarlet Boy won the dispute, while no one understood how he did it, but anyway the winner of this battle was decided. And the next day, the first brother ordered to give him a sword because he was impressed with his fight, and he will also join the trip starting tomorrow, and our boy got excited because now the second brother will teach him the sword exorcism technique. So he explained how it worked and the two practiced, while the other told the first brother that the bald one really liked the younger brother because he didn't want to teach that technique to them either. And so the next day, there was a merchant group passing through the mountains, but at that moment, the bandits of Mount Wolfing appeared to collect the toll, and the guy was surprised because he claims to be from the bandits guild and has less than 10 members. And then the boss ordered everyone to fill those guys with arrows for mocking Mount Wolfing, but that guy in blue cut all the arrows with a sword. So they realized they were screwed because there's someone with strong martial arts in the merchant group, and all the guards prepare to engage in battle, while the first brother says he'll draw their attention and everyone else should flee. But at that moment, Jeek steps forward saying that on Mount Wolfing, nobody can dare to laugh at them, and everyone was amazed, both the guard and the brothers. Then the guy in blue says he's just a kid and if he reconsiders his mistakes, he can let him live, but the Scarlet Boy is impatient today, saying he talks too much for someone who's going to be beaten to death, while the second brother asks if the other guy taught him that. But the guy in blue goes for it and Jeek cuts his sword with just one strike and was prepared 
preparing to beat him up again, while the guy in blue was scared because this kid is very strong, and when he realizes he almost had his head cut off in that attack, the guy in blue bows apologizing and asking him to spare his life. And so they managed to get a generous fee from that group while our monster was blossoming to the world. Then when they were coming back, the first brother asks how he did that, and actually, he used the sword exorcism technique that the second brother taught him, and not understanding, he asks Cheek to show them that technique. So he did, the guys gathered around, and it was just sword cuts, and when he gave the final cut, he brought down an entire tree, while everyone was surprised asking him to teach that technique, and even Han Chai came saying that it's really cool and she also wanted to learn, and the first and second brothers were thinking he's someone amazing. Then, on another day at the mountain of the five peaks, there was Jeek versus another merchant group. The guy came at him, he dodged, cut the old man's sword, and already had his sword at his neck. And so Jeek went on patrols from autumn to winter, but none of the warriors from the merchant school were able to stop his attacks, and there was even a poster being known as the bandit who was good with swords. And now, because of these rumors, countless people came to join Mount Wolfing, and so, three months later, the mountain of the five peaks quickly became a fortress. They began to gain fame within the province and their morale was growing, but with the fortress becoming larger, other dangers would arise. And so, these two had a plan to overthrow the seventh brother and remove the boss from power, since the rest wouldn't be able to take even one punch, besides the fact that the boss and vice boss would be nothing to this old man. And this is number 26, the northern sword, Gumul Shimyang. And he was wondering how a bunch of weaklings like them became known in the green mountain. And this green mountain is the dream of all mountain bandits, since like beggars have the beggar sacked, bandits have the green forest, and the commander of this forest is the demon lord who devastates his enemies, known to be monstrously strong. But the question remains, how would weaklings like them be recognized by the green forest? Or could it be the rumors about Jeek being the most powerful, although he thinks not even though he hasn't seen him in action yet because there are no patrols due to the weather. So other guys showed up to join this plan of taking their fortress, thinking they're just weaklings. Then, elsewhere, Han Chai was telling Jeek that those five who entered last are asking for a rank fight, and she even says they were mocking the boss. So Jeek gets pissed off, breaking the house door, because he's going to teach them a lesson. But the fourth brother was there asking what he's going to do, and when he said what he was going to do, the brother said that's what the boss was worried about, as he wasn't supposed to kill the newcomers yet. And so, the next day, the battle for ranks will begin, and those who want a challenge come forward. Old Man Yang's group came with five people. Then the boss says they can choose who they want to fight to get their ranks, however, starting from number seven upwards, they must fight each of them in sequence, meaning first they need to get through the monster to be able to fight the others, and the old man already says he's aiming for first place because they are all five notorious martial masters. So the battle begins. Jeet came walking asking which of the weaklings will get beaten up first, and seeing that pressure, the elders pass the guy at the back to fight first since it's normal for the lower ranked ones to go, right. While the guy who was about to say he felt a stomachache, the other just pushes him while Jeek asks if he's the first, and just from seeing that sensation, he was already scared shitless. So he says that since they're not enemies, they'll fight with clean hands, at least so he won't die. And he comes forward, and it was just one to the mouth, while Jeek tells the next one to come. Now the bald guy who asked to fight with clean hands too too, and this was just one to the stomach. But the other bold one wanted to face with weapons, and Jeek just attacked the man asking for the next one, because now only the elders were left to take a beating from our monster, and they were scared shitless, saying they needed time. But Jeek gave them a stare and the first of them stepped forward with a fan, saying he wouldn't use swords against someone from the same tower. So he, thinking Jeek fell for it, went at him since the fan is his weapon, but none of that helped, he just defended with his arms. The old man came again and he defended until Jeek realized this wasn't an ordinary fan, and the old man thinking he had already won the fight, just took a punch to the face and flew away. And so the next one will use swords, right? So he grabbed them and went at him, while the old man desperate says he has no more intentions of fighting, but Jeek just stares, saying if he dares to mess with his brothers, he'll be the next to die, and so the old man apologized in front of everyone, and the the crowd all went away with Jeek. Now in Hija village, where the merchant union is located, there was a crazy guy running to tell the master that they had problems because the rumors were true. The elders were seen at the fortress of the Five Peaks, in addition to countless merchants who have already been affected by them in the autumn. So Muriang asks who among the elders became the boss, but as for that, the boss remains the same, since based on the rumors, the two lost in the rank fights, and 30 people have already joined the fortress, and yet the boss here was thinking it was impossible. That's why Muriang stands up, saying they won't allow mountain bandits to cause chaos, and he'll use this opportunity to get rid of both the bandits and the elders, as he has an army from the merchant union. So, at the fortress of the five peaks, 
Jeek was cleaning his sword when a guy passed by mentioning he remembered Jeek when he heard that martial masters even use a leaf to cut people. But at that moment, fire arrows started hitting the walls because the Union army was attacking, and Jeek was furious because they were breaking the walls they had built. As if the fire wasn't enough, they even pulled them down into pieces. But as they passed the first wall, they were screwed because there was another wall, so now Jeek himself will break this wall, and Jeek, back there, asked if the enemy leader is in front of them, and on the first swing, Jeek comes already breaking the barrier and everything in his face, and he went straight at him asking if he was the leader. So, they exchanged blows and the axe guy was shocked by all this strength, so that must be the sword-wielding bandit from the rumors. But none of that matters because he just set fire to Jeek's house and now things are about to get messy. And before the fight, our good boy asks how he's going to make up for that, but he's not going to make up for anything, he came here to finish them all off. So Jeek asks why he's talking so much, since when people have different opinions the strongest one is always correct, isn't it? And so the guy with the bun throws away the axe and draws his sword because he's not going to hold back anymore, but for Jeek, everyone always says that so he shouldn't lose too quickly, then he went for it and Jeek went along, and the guy with the bun was using the immutable noon technique, and Jeek found it interesting and ended up blocking all attacks saying that's a pretty cool technique, and actually the guy thought it was absurd because that's a technique from the Hua Mountain sect, so he asks who the hell he is and where he came came from, but Jeek doesn't have any of that, he just uses the martial art of the demon slaying technique that his brother taught him, and according to him, no one has been able to last more than one blow and he also had fun watching the technique of the guy with the bun. Then the man asks if he can copy him, but he can only try. Jeek went in using the same technique, while the guy is shocked because this is the final technique and the mystery of the six combinations of the Hua Mountain Sword, and it may seem simple but several variations can be made with it. And the six sword combinations are the basis of the sword blossoming technique and therefore it must be taught to all disciples of the Hua Mountain, and even the disciples have difficulty understanding the mystery of this technique, but Li Muriang managed to understand and became a martial master who took over the Hunan province and everyone who came at him was destroyed, but Jeek was using that technique just from seeing it once, so he thinks he should stay calm since the real body must be back there, but when Jeek arrived swinging the sword all the bodies were real, meaning he not only copied but surpassed Li Muriang, and so he himself fell before Jeek finished using the technique, and as he passed out, he'll just have to cut off his head, right? Then the guy yells saying he's still alive and he'll never come near the fortress of the five peaks again, and he swears by his right arm. So Jeek walks away saying it's better he keeps his promise, and thus the fortress of the five peaks won the battle as the rival army retreated. And there was a man up there watching everything that happened. And this way, except for the smaller merchant unions in the province of Hunan, three of the largest merchant unions fell, and eventually even the Mansa Union was defeated, and it can be said that this is a major change in the balance of power. And according to rumors, the numbers of the fortress of the five peaks will increase even more. So, the long-haired guy says that even though it's better to attack before they get stronger, he thinks that young bandit might be the disciple of the chief commander of the green forest because it wouldn't make sense for him to be so strong like this. And he also appeared at a time when the lord was trying to expand his territory. So, if he is indeed a disciple, it's better for them to stay away. But the guy just breaks the table saying how they can't run away from bandits, because if they did, the Mansu Merchant Union would be the laughingstock of the entire region, and this guy is nothing more than the leader of that union. But the other guy says he can't handle it either, and it's true because that guy is on a different level and he was also the one up there watching the fight. And so the boss says he's going to Huguang province, because there is Wudong Mountain, and even if he were an external disciple, he learned in the Wudong sect and his master is the elder of the sect, the wise Chunji. And this Wudong sect is one of the ten great sects and its direct disciples are on a level they can't even imagine. So, the plan is to ask the master to lend one of these disciples to finish off Jeek and destroy the fortress of the Five Peaks. And now we're in Haija village, at the most expensive restaurant, but of course they don't need to worry about anything because Jeek, the strongest in Hunan province, came alone. But he thinks it's a bit exaggerated and these clothes are too expensive. But according to the pink-haired one, it's okay because he has already earned a lot of money for the fortress, and the second brother himself gave money to them and made them promise that Cheek would have a great time. And he takes the opportunity to ask who this woman is because he's never seen her before. And her name is Soha, she joined the fortress a week ago. But at that moment, a bald guy came up asking if he hadn't seen her around here, and the other one asks who the jerk is. But she was already fed up and told the bald guy to go away because she didn't want to break this table full of food and he doesn't need to die, so both sides leave happy. And he immediately started touching them, saying his patience has limits. But Jeek tells him to stop right there and says that since he's in a good mood, he'll count to 10, and if the guy leaves, his life will be spared, and the bald guy was furious. While the pink-haired one said he's going to die because they're from the fortress of the five peaks and that guy there is the sword-wielding bandit, and since he's still there, it was just a kick in the gut that broke everything, and outside, 
there was a guy with a lot of pressure. Minutes before that, the union leader was saying he'd call the carriage for him and asks why he came personally, since this is the elder of the Wudong sect, the wise Chun Ji, and he, in reality, didn't expect him to come in person, because when they hear that he called an elder to subdue mere bandits, he'll be a laughingstock. And since he's letting these rumors affect him, the wise one says he still has much to learn and after the end of this incident, he should go for isolated training and train his body and mind. But it was at that same moment that the bald guy flew out of the restaurant, and there was the guy with insane pressure outside. And when the leader came to see the commotion, that brat was the bandit from the fortress. So he arrives saying it's him and him, but the master just tells him to stop causing trouble and walks towards the carriage, while Jeek noticed that guy had a sinister energy. But the pink-haired one came saying how can he destroy everything like that because the boss said they shouldn't cause trouble, but it was the guy who annoyed him first, and he even gave him 10 seconds to run, and still he had to kick over the food table. And this way, with all the money left, they should still afford soup and rice after paying for the repairs, and unfortunately, they won't be able to buy clothes for so Beck who was excited to dress like a bandit. But wait, she never said that, and she just covers her mouth saying that next time they'll buy. Then Jeek, not understanding, tells her to buy clothes instead of food, but that still wouldn't be enough, and if he's sorry for that, he should start listening to one of their requests, and our naive Scarlet boy says he'll do anything, so the pink-haired one asks him to teach martial arts to them. And then we go back to the cowardly leader who was asking why didn't he get rid of the bandit right there, but there were rumors that he was a disciple of the demon lord who devastates the heavens, but probably not because if he had a disciple as good as that, rumors would have spread long ago, and that's why he's starting to think it was a good idea to come here because he just found a martial arts genius. So, three days ago, at Wudong Mountain, the sect leader brought Long Jing tea leaves as a gift for Chun Ji, and since he brought something so valuable, there must be something he wants to say, and in fact, the merchants are having major issues with the fortress of the Five Peaks and the recent movements of the Green Forest. And in this case, the leader of the merchants' union seems to be his external disciple, and the bearded one asks if he remembers how the Moon Fairy sect was a threat to the Miram world, and after that incident, he feels that the Orthodox Alliance must grow stronger because the Moon Fairy attempted to use its terrible martial arts to take over the Central Plain, and even though the Sword Emperor and the Moonbreaker protected the world, they can no longer rely on their forces because who can? guarantee that the world will not face other threats like those. Unorthodox sects are also not exceptions to being future threats because the commander of the Green Forest killed numerous warriors and today in the Muran world there would be no one who could rival him, so before they can rely on the lord who devastates the heavens, he wants him to finish them off completely because then the sect could increase its influence to Hunan province, and that would be like killing two birds with one stone. However, Chun Ji has a condition, he will subdue the fortress of the five peaks on his own. Then he asks why he would do that, but as he has managed this place for the past 10 years, he has seen countless divinations, and strangely, whenever he tried, he never saw luck and he also never saw bad luck. But the reading he had this morning was different because it was a great fortune, and so he is sure that this is an opportunity, since the sword-wielding bandit has a different energy. And if he takes care of him as a sect disciple, he can become the most powerful swordsman in the world. And then the question arises, will he succeed or will the great fortune be the big beating he will take? And so, on the mountain of the five peaks, the construction was completed, and this is the Harmony Pavilion of the fortress. As they were growing rapidly, the Daviol Fortress helped them build some places, and so the first brother recruited carpenters, counselors, and their families. But then a guy comes running asking if he saw Jeek, but he's actually in the forest teaching the girls. And there he says they need to memorize 300 words first, those who want to obtain the nine celestial energies must first conquer their own hearts. Then they say that's too hard, because 100 is already too much, now imagine 300. So he tells them to close their eyes and follow him gradually, which makes it easier, and then they closed their eyes and focused on breathing, and he also did the same. Until later they woke up and Jeek was still focused, while inside his mind, he was handling his sword. But he heard a voice telling him to calm down and focus only on the voices of his heart, and asking who he is, he sees himself when he was young, that is, the person from the mirror. Then they started to move and the concepts that seemed vague were coming together one by one, until some light leaves appeared above his head, and when he woke up, they disappeared. Then the girls ask if they will be able to do it if they continue training, and so they started to return to the fortress. But when they got there, only the chief was there, while everyone else disappeared, and in fact, they didn't disappear, they fled because the merchant union managed to involve the sage Chun Ji, and they are coming to attack. So the first brother asks what they want to do, and since they will arrive tomorrow, he suggests they flee, then he asks the old man, but in his view, the fortress of the five peaks was already done because the sage Chun Ji is an elder of the Wudong sect. He is the strongest one there and his disciples are also incredibly powerful, and if he wants to deal with these monsters, just pray for the neck to stay on the head. And so the brother asks Jeek, 
and he also doesn't know what to do. The grumpy old man is already grunting that he's leaving because he doesn't plan to wait for death, and after seeing the old man's attitude, everyone else left, while only the real ones we know who they are. And Jeek, seeing this, asks the first brother if the sage can cut a person with a leaf. So, the leaf thing got into his head too, right? The chief says he doesn't think so, and can anyone really do that? But if he's not that strong, Jeek says he can fight him. The chief gets excited, but remembering what the old man said, there's a chance the sage is very strong and could kill Jeek. So he can't put this kid in a life or death situation. And so, he begins to say that it's been five years since they've been living here, and especially this year we had new members and several good things happened. But he's thinking he can't risk and put all these people in a situation where they could die. So, he says from this moment on the mountain of the five peaks is disbanded. Until at night, the chief was alone thinking that he himself wouldn't be able to escape from here. But suddenly a rope loosens up there and here comes wood. And in fact, who was down there was the second brother saying that he really thought they would leave like that and in fact, everyone is still here. Because if they were to die, they would die together. And so, they repaired the walls again and set up a bonfire. While the chief was saying that it would be good to alternate shifts to stand guard, as they might face a surprise attack. So now Razanya stands up saying that now that they have decided to stand together in life and in death, he should make them his family too. And this way, the whole family was reunited. Shu San is now number 8. Shayan is number 9. Sobik is number 10. From today onwards, they are all siblings of the same family. And thus, at dawn, the sage Chun Ji was coming with his entire army. While Jeek couldn't sleep at all thinking if he could win against someone like the sage. But there's no choice because he needs to win for everyone to live together. But at that moment, the chief ended up startling him because he was also awake. And he asks why he wasn't sleeping. And Jeek says he doesn't sleep much even though he has a black eye, he looks like me. And so the chief draws his sword because they are going to have a duel to relax their muscles. The chief apologizes for depending on him again. But at that moment, a shout comes from outside calling for the fortress of the five peaks. And the chief jumps onto the wall saying how their leader is pathetic because he went to cry and beg for the sage Chun Ji to come here. And even if someone stronger than the sage were here, they wouldn't be shaken. So the sage steps forward and shouts. Jeek realizes it's going to be a mess and tells the chief to get out of there. At that moment, the entire bottom wall was destroyed, and the sage appeared in front of the chief with a sword. But at that moment, Jeek simply sent a slashing attack to protect the chief, and the sage was impressed. And then, in happiness, he went on the offensive. While Jeek raised his sword and delivered a strike from the dragon's claws, in an instant the young man is attacking more directly, in a sword impasse, Jeek is thrown away. What kind of monster is the sage? If you can feel an overwhelming force just by crossing swords with him, however, the scarlet boy believes himself to be much stronger. The opponent wonders about the reason for such presumption, it is truly surprising that the boy can wield sword energy at such a young age, yet there are still limits to his arrogance. Recalling the past, we see that this is not their first encounter, even back then, the self-proclaimed sage was no match for the protagonist, at least from his perspective. And it doesn't stop there, the young man even claims to be glad that Chun Ji is the sage, after all, the old man doesn't seem very strong. The enemy seems to become excited for a moment, this kind of attitude is everything he was looking for, seeking numerous talents while traveling through Jianghu, he had never met anyone so brave, especially since all the martial warriors in that region kneeled before his overwhelming presence. If the Scarlet Boy is truly as skilled as he thinks, this is the time to prove it. The two return to crossing swords in the sky. Everyone watches the battle. We see the boss quite weakened, wondering what's happening. His companion explains the situation, informing that at this very moment, the protagonist and the sage are fighting equally. In the midst of the fight, the old man distances himself and decides to elevate the level of his technique, however, the Scarlet Boy is not intimidated and responds in kind by approaching the adversary, thus blocking his attack. A little nervous, we follow the thoughts of the Elder, is it possible that this young man could really be the disciple of the sky-destroying demonic lord? Upon asking the boy who his master would be, in a symbolic gesture he merely raises his sword. The old man seems satisfied, now understanding why he received a great fortune omen in the divination, the strength of the Scarlet boy may be enough to learn all the advanced techniques of the Wudong sect. Then suddenly the flow of energy from the man changes, the technique he uses is called Taiji Mystique, a power that only the elders of the group can learn. Jeek looks with hostility, soon deciding to attack, but is surprised to be easily overthrown. When he turns his attention back to the opponent, he cannot find him, however, the man was located behind him preparing a blow from which the young man admits he cannot escape. Oh read. By some miracle, it's possible to dodge that fatal technique, perhaps because the elder had no intention of ending the fight so quickly. The attacks keep coming towards Jeek who defends against them. 
Until the sage decides to take things a bit more seriously, showing an unusual strength. Instead of being afraid, our boy taunts the enemy to annoy him as much as possible. Meanwhile, the martial artists try to save themselves from the explosion. As the blow finishes, all that remains around are rubble. Chun didn't limit his power due to so much excitement, it had been a long time since he had fought without holding back. The man was too convinced, however, his presumption ends when he notices a golden aura, and terror takes over, as that energy takes the form of a golden dragon. Even the lord who was recently confident seems shaken. The system of humiliating secondary characters with stolen power is on point, congratulations to the author of the work. Suddenly we're taken to the east side of Luoyang, in Waryong's mansion. We observe several people training, and others eating at a sort of banquet. A scarlet-haired boy appears thanking everyone for their presence. And he finishes his thought by saying he has learned many things after training for several years in the Nandong clan, since he has learned more techniques. The young man would like to show them a glimpse of his strength. An old woman starts grumbling, commenting on Marabak's martial art that reached seven stars, saying that it should be enough to recognize him as a martial master. After swinging the sword a few times, the observers are impressed, questioning the nature of that technique. Concentrating deeply, the boy summons the image of a great dragon, using its claws to cleave the earth, then attacks for the last time, splitting the ground in three directions. Everyone immediately realizes, this is an extremely rare power. We return to the present, where the infamous sage remains perplexed. The protagonist begins to murmur, after all, his enemy was hiding his true strength. From that moment on, the two would fight seriously. This doesn't make the old man sad, in fact, he seems even more excited. The situation couldn't be better, to challenge him like this one must be at least crazy, accepting the challenge to fight with all his might, the old man invests in a thrust with his sword, our boy also prepares to crossblades, and even uses the claw technique that destroys the earth in different parts, the sage looks back surprised. The scarlet boy warns not to get distracted in the midst of battle, and in an instant, he launches into the attack, resulting in a final confrontation, this last moment would determine the winner. Finally, it seems to be over, with a cold expression the sage asks if he could have the honor of knowing the boy's name. The protagonist responds to be Ji Ka, which means Scarlet Boy. Upon hearing this, the old man drops his sword and collapses to the ground. I must say he was a good opponent. The people around are impressed by the outcome of the fight. The boy turns with a smile on his face informing his boss that he won the fight. The man is impressed for a moment and then jumps for joy along with his comrades. Even the girls got excited. The young man gets a VIP ride on the boss's back. This victory is a big step for the Five Peaks Fortress. The sage is crawling while his subordinate wonders what the possibility is of his master losing, then rushes to his aid, noticing serious wounds, saying that his superior needs to treat this immediately. The old man is happy after taking a beating of a lifetime. It's understandable, after all, the man didn't get beaten by just anyone. The elder mentions seeing angels calling him from nearby. When the moment of happiness ends, the man considers whether it is possible to judge them, but that would be difficult, as he would need to raise an army. Regarding the Scarlet Boy, it is strictly forbidden to even think about facing him. Suddenly we are taken to Hunan province, where two people are discussing the recent defeat of Sage Chunji. The young man with a cap on his head says that these rumors are ridiculous, such a strong figure would not lose to mere mountain bandits. A mysterious man gets involved in the conversation, commenting on the great ability of the Scarlet Boy, saying that it is possible that the great elder of the Wudong sect was completely defeated by the boy, he himself, the leader of the Nanyang Merchant Union, named Li Muriang, personally experienced the protagonist's sword. Those movements, the technique was amazing to the point of leaving him completely powerless. A group of warriors who also lost to Arjik appear excited, losing is not usually a source of pride, who knows what's going on in these guys' heads. It's no longer a secret to absolutely anyone in Han province, the Union failed to defeat their enemies, this brought good fame to the Five Peaks Fortress, still, for the sake of the sect the Union leader tried to end the rumors to protect the merchant's reputation, however, the protagonist's group is already being recognized as one of the strongest, when not long ago they were not even known. At the same time, rumors claimed that ten heroes protected the Five Peaks Fortress, among them one name in particular became famous. Exactly my friends, it's Cheek. A man is reporting the situation saying that hundreds of Union warriors were retired early by ten soldiers from the Five Peaks, hence they became known as the Ten Legends. The figure who seems to be a mobster reflects on all this fame, after all, 
A few months ago there were only seven bandits, their group has grown a lot. They must have been lucky enough to bring someone strong enough to fight together. Another old man appears talking about the mission's failure. The guy asks about the base of the green forest, located in Mansipyong, as it is necessary to check the level of the mountain bandits. Returning to the main subjects, a beggar is kneeling in front of the boss, begging for mercy for abandoning his people. The leader asks the scoundrel to stand up, the guy obeys the order, but is terrified, believing he would be punished. However, the boss just welcomes him, receiving him with a warm hug. It's even strange for someone who thought they had already been sentenced to a life of selling embarrassing images to pay off debts with the loan shark. The boy thanks for the kindness with tears in his eyes. A companion of the boss suddenly appears, questioning if a slightly stricter punishment would be appropriate, thus the fortress will seem weak to others, they need to choose people loyal enough not to put them in danger. The commander imparts some wisdom to Gomion, saying the following, the man who plants sunflower seeds on his head makes his hair grow. Oops, wrong passage, actually, they need to work to be recognized as part of the green forest. The bald guy wonders how they will do that. The boss continues, stating that the organization's summit will happen soon, they will use this occasion to create powerful allies, but for that, they need people capable of protecting their territory while they are away from home. Now things start to make sense for Gomyung, still, the more mouths to feed demand more food as well, and for that, they will need help. By the way, our scarlet boy seems to be busy looking for the sage. A moment later the old man appears, with an eagle on his arm, a message was addressed to him requesting his return to the sect. After seeing the message, the sage looks back a little surprised, welcoming the protagonist, who seems a little tired. The young man asks if the man won't go back. As a response, he gets a smile, the old man says he has no reason to return, it's been some time since he took a vacation, so he's thinking of enjoying a few days. The boy is actually bothered because the lazy one there is resting in a place like this instead of going to the merchant union. Quickly, the elder interrupts the young man's reasoning by asking if the boy would accept his proposal. Confused about the meaning of that, Jeek imagines that the old rascal must want him as a disciple. In reality, it's nothing like that. At a certain point in the story, the old man was called the strongest practitioner of the Wudong group because he was able to accumulate internal energy as effectively as anyone else, and understand all the advanced teachings of the technique, yet there is a power that even a genius like him cannot fully master. For 30 years, the man has trained in the mystic Taiji swordsmanship, however, he has not been able to surpass the limits of the four ultimatums, our boy has no idea about the nature of these four ultimatums, and the old man apparently doesn't want to explain, instead, he only expresses his desire to learn from the boy. The boy seems very unhappy about this. Even if he ends up training him, teaching the technique of the demon slaying blade is out of the question because it is too precious to Gomion. The man clarifies his interests, the truth is that it would be great to learn this art too, but it won't be necessary, just observing and learning while the Scarlet Boy fights is enough, furthermore, striking a deal between the two would be beneficial for both parties. With that said, the old man attacks the young man, gathering strength in his fist. If the protagonist had lice, he just got rid of them, the impact of the blow even destroyed part of the forest. This power is something that can be passed on with one condition. Both must have a reciprocal relationship of teaching. If the Scarlet Boy tells the sage what is lacking in his technique to be perfected, the old man will return the favor. And he continues explaining, the young man can be really strong, however, he has not yet reached his full potential because he probably does not understand the basic theories of martial arts. After mastering this, the warrior's level evolves into something deeper. Well, it's time for training. The two begin to spend time with the purpose of getting stronger, improving in all aspects. A certain amount of time seems to have passed, and both are walking peacefully while watching some children playing. One of them goes to the old man to give him a flower. The old man thanks him, and caresses the boy's head. Our protagonist starts grumbling saying he hates kids. The reason for this doesn't seem clear to his new companion, clarifying the reason for his hatred. The truth is that children have malicious minds minds, capable of committing atrocities against others. Regardless, the man believes in the kindness of all the inhabitants of the fortress, yet Jeek doesn't change his ideas, that place is no different from any other, it's just a populated territory. At the end of the day, a woman is gathering firewood, wondering if it's enough, she concludes that she should return. Suddenly a hand falls on her shoulder, the elder appears and says he will also pick up wood. This situation is unpleasant for the girl, after all, a sect leader shouldn't do anything like that. However, such things are not a bother for a man with one foot in the grave, as with age, his time becomes increasingly idle. From the perspective of ordinary people, a group master is someone noble, supposed to have everything available. The sage comments that he used to have prejudice against the mountain bandits. The young woman questions why he seems to have changed his mind. The reason is that it is a peaceful place and good to live in. Our girl agrees, 
This region is different from other communities, most of which used to be inhabited by thieves. Many of the fortress residents moved there because it's hard to live decently. Even the girl was a victim of this cruel world, as she was almost sold to a brothel. The boss was great to her as he gave her work, besides Jeek's protection that makes that region a peaceful place. The man is curious about how the Scarlet Boy joined the group. Even though not knowing the details, the girl recounts that in the past the boy was saved by the boss when he was about to die. This leaves the old man a little intrigued, risking his life to protect everyone to repay a kind of debt. If the girl had to guess, she would say it's for a different reason, it's possible that the Scarlet Boy considers the village as part of his family. Well, enough chit chat, it's time to go back with the wood. We change the scene and witness something rather sinister. A group of guys seems to be getting eliminated. The masked man even sucked the soul out of this bald guy. After releasing the poor fellow, the man congratulates his master for reaching the level of great demonic general. She affirms that the long-awaited moment has finally arrived, the anger she held for the past 20 years has not been forgotten for a single day. The Sword Emperor, the Moonlight Swordsman, and all the other sects in Jiang who knelt before the Moon Fairy. Suddenly we are introduced to the notorious demon of Hunan Province. The Northern Sword of Gumul, called Shim Yangak, seems to be in quite a predicament. In a bar, we see a bunch of old folks sitting around chatting. The topic relates to stories about the defeat of the Merchant Union. It seems to be a very popular rumor, as it is widely discussed by people. The Northern Sword doesn't believe in these nonsense, as do most other masters, after all, such a large organization would crush a small group like the Five Peaks Fortress. It's likely that no attack happened according to Shim. Perhaps the sage destroyed the fortress completely and defeated the arrogant Scarlet Boy along with all his brothers, if that happened the entire region would be nothing more than an uninhabited area, and with the absence of a leader, he would appear as a hero and become the great chief of the whole area. This would be their great triumph. However, now it's all over. Greedy old man, indeed. At the adjacent table, people seem to be making similar comments, paying special attention to the ten heroes of the Five Peaks, saying they are very powerful. The old man wonders if there would be any chance of facing them, after all, such strength was not within his expectations. In fact, many people abandoned the fortress, but the boss welcomed them all back. The elders discuss what they should do, as their objective was not completed. Shim's theory is that the merchant union was bluffing when confirming the inclusion of a master in subjugating mere bandits. A large part of the opportunists at the table begin to complain about the grumpy old man's flawed plan, which infuriates him. One of the men talks about all the trust placed in the northern sword of Gumul. Even when Beck suggested they go to the Crimson Wind Fortress, they decided to refuse the invitation and follow the old man. But if they are to remain loyal, they need something to believe in. People continue to discuss, if the rumors are true, then the fortress accepts deserters back, which is quite beneficial for the group as a whole because the more soldiers, the better to consolidate the title of the Green Forest. Perhaps if the group brings flowers and chocolate, the boss will accept them as members of the gang. The bald guy starts to opine, saying it's a terrible idea, after all, the Scarlet Boy must be even more violent than before, this won't make things so simple, poor guy just spoke the truth and got punched for it. A guy tries to argue, no one in the village should suspect they fled, surely they eagerly await the team's return. Thinking a little about it, the leader believes it to be true. Returning to the Five Peaks Fortress, we see several people closely watching some kind of abnormal activity. Well, who was in front of them was precisely the old man's group. Their return, in particular, is a bold move, after all, they were the first deserters when the territory began to be threatened. No one is happy to see them, however, the approval of all is not necessary. The only opinion that really matters is that of the boss according to the Northern Sword. His subordinate asks if the commander will believe the story they created. In case the man is deceived, it won't change the people's feelings or the way they will be treated with hostility. The old man says not to worry, no citizen would dare to offend them directly. As he speaks, the man looks ahead and sees remnants of a battle. That was certainly the result of a violent fight, and only one person in the fortress is capable of doing such a thing. But no matter how strong Jeek is, it's not the kind of mark that a technique like the demon slaying sword could make. Suddenly an individual appears, catching the group's attention, questioning the audacity of those people to return as if nothing had happened. The northern sword instinctively turns, asking who would dare to insult him in such a way. With a smile on his face and an axe on his back, the man proudly introduces himself, he was Lee Chulson. The old head calls the guy crazy, where's the respect for the elders? The man drops his axe, seething with anger, after all, it should be the old man who should be showing proper respect. At the chief's base, we see the messenger notifying the arrival of Shim and his group. The commander reflects a bit on the sudden return. The bald advisor seems angry, however, he praises him in a way, as the northern sword must have a lot of courage to return in this manner, our boss shouldn't take them back so easily. The advisor never liked the cunning old man, whatever reason he had for abandoning the battle, he did it dishonorably, 
even encouraging the soldiers to go along. Aware of the circumstances, the boss states that the old man is a very strong martial warrior, enough to be recognized as a demon, which makes him an extremely valuable asset in times of conflict. The bald man stands firm in his opinion, the fortress is able to defend itself now, undoubtedly they are capable of fighting against Shim and his group. For the leader, this is not necessarily true, although they lost pathetically against the Scarlet Boy, that old man has very beautiful martial arts. We return to follow the impasse between old acquaintances. Their conversation is full of provocations, inevitably, the two end up facing each other. The white-haired man takes the initiative, going after his opponent, who is also ready to receive the attack. By blocking the old man, the man becomes convinced of victory, even pushing him away, demonstrating superiority and strength. One of the deserters stays alert, Cholson is a notable opponent, but his power level has never been enough to gain an advantage when it comes to powerful martial warriors like the Grumpy Shim. The evolution of an artist in such a short period is surprising. What could be the source of such sudden power? The man practically answers the question, saying he was trained by the Scarlet Boy. Apparently, the old man isn't as strong as they say. This leaves the Grumpy Man quite unhappy. It's true, there's a kind of evolution compared to Chuzin's previous level, however, it's still not enough to be a battle worthy of effort. With a single blow, the man turns into an ostrich. Regaining his composure, the young man demonstrates willpower by attacking again. This infuriates his opponent, for challenging him, his fate was only one, so the northern sword employs a deadly technique, but is abruptly stopped by the old man with just one finger. This leaves him perplexed, what's happening? The old man was stopped from using lethal power, yet this shouldn't be possible. The unfolding of events makes it evident that there's another monster in the area besides the Scarlet Boy. The fallen man says he will punish him. Chulson is determined to win and show all his capability to the wise Chunji. It's at this moment that the grumpy one notices the figure before him. Could that really be the wise one, the one sent to subdue the entire area? The white-haired one starts shaking all over. There was still some doubt, until the man introduces himself as the elder of Wudong. So the rumors were correct. Immediately he is questioned why the sage remained in the green forest fortress. But according to Chun, this simply doesn't interest him, Shim isn't even part of the territory. Soon after, the protagonist appears welcoming the old man, who would have thought, he really returned. So maybe he's ready to endure the punishment resulting from his actions. We advance a little in time and observe the old man exercising. You know, that's good in a way, exercising a little won't hurt. As he walks, the grumpy one begins to reflect on all his past glory, and to think he used to rule the province of Hunan. How he has fallen so far as to assume such a humiliating position, even though all worn out, the man swears not to forget the events of that day, promising to avenge the Scarlet Boy, as hours ago he had taken a beating from the protagonist. We follow him again, as he continues angrily, until a certain point, where a mysterious energy begins to emanate from an unknown location, the pressure surpasses that of Jeek himself. Further on, we discover the source of this power. The sage Chun Ji, holder of a giant ball and penetrating eyes. Our dear elder seems to be training. The scarlet boy advances on the elder's jugular. It seems the old man's mastery with his technique has increased, allowing him to surpass the protagonist. However, when attacking, Jeek easily holds back the blow, making him wonder if something has changed. Unfortunately, it was too early to judge, because suddenly a great explosive aura emerges. My condolences to the worms and ants of the place, they must have evaporated. The fight spectator is impressed, not even the scarlet boy would be able to dodge that. The unexpected happens, but for us it's no surprise, the boy is in a good mood, after all, he can no longer use just the demon slaying technique to block the old man's attacks. Finally, the time has come to demonstrate all his potential by using the celestial art in its second form, not even the sky can contain the power of the blow. Noting this, the white-haired one is impressed. Chun admits that if he had been hit, there wouldn't be a single hair left to tell the tale. The protagonist warns that the man hasn't even shown his full potential. But according to the sage, there's no reason to reveal everything, as he has already achieved his goal, it's time to leave. Well, it's not necessarily the ending the protagonist expected, things were just starting to heat up now. Now, you can even understand the old man's side, after all, if he goes back home full of injuries, he'll end up losing prestige. Still, it's a pity, the boy even wondered if there would be a new bandit in the mountains. However, the elder is determined to return to the Wudong sect, but that doesn't mean he'll forget the boy's kindness. Could this be the beginning of a long friendship? Both spent a lot of time training, and it's revealed that for Chun, it was meaningful to witness Jeek's evolution. One day the boy will appear in Nurem. This was their farewell. Shim suddenly gave up on revenge. A month later, a person appears climbing the mountains, suddenly a bear appears threatening him, but there's a reason for that, the wretch eliminated the animal's cubs, and still makes light of it, then, he annihilates the mother bear in seconds. This guy's name is Ian, the Sovereign Wind. 
We are introduced to the commander of the Green Forest, Lord Suk Mohi, considered one of the strongest in the world, he has never been defeated, and used to work in the Shaolin Temple, aiming to learn techniques, but refused to shave his head. Even though he was strong, he was far from valuing Buddhism. One day the boy was cleaning a Buddha statue and broke it, his fate changed there. Inside it was a manual of techniques from the Black Paradise Azura. By mastering these arts, the man left the temple and wandered the world recruiting bandits in Jianghu to pass on his techniques, the group became strong enough to threaten any elder. Thus, the twelve demon generals were born. In the fortress of the five peaks, we see a man shouting for the commander of the place, informing that he is an emissary of the green forest and a direct disciple of the demon lord. The chief arrives at the scene and finds the drunkard shouting about how glorious he is. People don't know how to react to the situation, even the leader seems confused. The drunkard encounters nine of the ten heroes and asks about the last one in the group. The chief says the last member is training in isolation. For the chubby guy, that's no excuse, if he's breathing, he has to greet him. A guy comments on Jeek, actually, the boy is taking a nap in the room. Gomyung asks for silence, saying that if the protagonist meets that drunkard, it could end up in a coffin and a black candle. The chubby guy starts praising the group, if they were able to survive for so long they must be strong. If they keep up the good behavior, they won't have problems. The chief bows and informs to keep that in mind, besides, he offers hospitality to the visitor. However, the old man is interested in having some fun with the two girls there. Our leader comments that those two are heroines, perhaps the chubby guy prefers to enjoy something different. Even better for the demon general, they were attractive before, and now they're heroines on top of that. Trying to distract the dirty old man, the chief changes the subject, but is soon interrupted by the drunkard, the guy says he's not done yet. The woman asks the reason behind such an important visit. The man gets excited upon hearing a female voice, there are only men training in the sections. There's a reason he's visiting them, and it's to see if the group deserves to receive the flag of the green forest. If they're not worthy, everyone will get a brand new tombstone. Anyway, their reputation is good, and they've contributed to increasing the fame of the green forest, not to mention the beautiful ladies who are part of the group. This guy doesn't miss an opportunity, so the old man accepts the mountain bandits as part of the green forest. The chief receives a scroll, invited to attend the grand summit in Mansipian, where a unification tournament is being held. Finally, they've been recognized. Now that the message is delivered, the old man would like to have some fun there in the fortress. The chief says he'll treat him very well and sends him to an entertainment house. Now the priority is to get out of there before the monster wakes up and knocks out this drunkard. Already in the pleasure house, the old man seems to be well accommodated, surrounded by women. However, the demon is only interested in the heroines and orders them to be brought to him. The chief doesn't seem to obey the order, moreover, he tries to explain himself. But the Windeen doesn't want to hear excuses, if they don't come to his room, everyone will die. In the fortress, we see the two girls sleeping. Suddenly they wake up to the sound of screams. Upon checking what's happening, the girls come face to face with the drunkard, and the old man quickly orders them to set the table for them. The chief tries to calm the man down, but this only makes him more agitated. How dare an inferior touch him? Are they testing his patience? The leader tries to clarify things, saying he's trying to avoid trouble for the wind sovereign himself. The guy gets confused, then starts reaffirming his authority over that region, as they're disobeying him, they'll feel his wrath. This would indeed happen if someone didn't interrupt him. A voice emerges asking who's making so much noise at night. Ian tries to retort, but the voice persists, if the man is out of his mind, then he should go home instead of causing trouble. The words seem to come from one of the girl's mouths, the girl quickly becomes frightened. The demon demands that the speaker reveal himself in order to eliminate him, and the scarlet boy appears still yawning. Ian wonders if the boy is crazy, otherwise he wouldn't act like that, and moreover, the people around don't seem distressed. The boy stands still. The drunkard concludes that dirtying his hands would be a waste of time, it's better to just ignore it. However, Jeek questions if the man is running away, perhaps he's scared. The chubby guy doesn't take this insult lightly, so he attacks immediately. In this, the attack came and Jeek blocked with just one hand, saying that the old man turned into a comedian because he's very weak. The old man came saying that the attack didn't seem strong, but now he's going to take it to another level and show why he's called the sovereign of Ian Wind. Then the people in the back wondered if the old man would be okay or if there would be some health plan. So the old man came right at Jeek's neck, saying that cutting off a head is as simple as breathing. But Jeek got mad because he was taking everything lightly, and as he crossed the line, he was done with these antics. While he was amazed to see why that thing on his neck shouldn't have come off so easily, since most martial artists from the nine great sects would fall for that technique, Jeek wanted to fight. 
He thought the level of the chief and vice chief was quite average, so he was even wondering how they subdued the entire province. So, this must be the reason why the Five Peaks Fortress became so famous. And for that reason, he says it's interesting since he, the sovereign of Ian Wind, will fight someone decent. But just hearing that name, Jeek started laughing because that name sounds like what a horny dog would have. And he, angry, says these will be his last words and shows his claws. Jeek, insolent, said he's too slow. So it was the supreme unique technique cadaverous claws. And even though the attack was so big, Jeek defended with just two fingers. Finding it strange, the old man used the Dark Sky Azure attack, thinking he had been through many painful moments to learn this unique martial art from the Demon Lord, and that's why he never lost after mastering it. So he came with everything, but Jeek held his hand in the middle of the attack, saying he sent a chilly breeze and he's young Jeek ha. So it was for the old man not to mess with his friends. When it was time for the punch, the leader shouted for Jeek not to do it, otherwise it would screw up the whole plan of the Green Forest. While the guy only saw a huge dragon with its mouth open coming to eat him, he already thought that the god of death would come to take him. But luckily, Jeek stopped the fist right in his face, sending that immense power pressure backwards, so the guy fell to his knees. With Jeek saying that if it weren't for the boss, he'd be a dead man. Boy, with that, the guy's hair stood on end and he lost his will to fight, because what he felt was an intimidating pressure that he had only felt from the demon lord himself. And he says he made a huge mistake for being drunk. So Jeek already wants to send the guy to say goodbye to the brothers and leave. Then he tries to say that there's a hierarchy in the green forest, but Jeek just looks serious, saying he's damn tired and he's planning to keep annoying him here. And at the same time, the guy appeared by the gate saying goodbye to everyone because they will meet again in Mansipion. And in this, everyone was shocked, as they were called brothers by one of the forest generals, even though they are still in the lowest rank. Seeing this, everyone around was happy. Chaiyan told the other to hook up with Jeek later, while the first and second brothers asked if they would really be fine at the forest summit. Then, in the midst of the rush, the guy couldn't believe he was humiliated like this, because that fortress hit a monster like that. And how they're going to participate in the summit, it's definitely going to be chaos. So he was hurrying to inform the commander about this. Meanwhile, in another corner, a man in the carriage ordered the other to reveal himself. Up ahead, he simply said they were working hard to travel at this hour and that he would just check something simple. But the carriage owner didn't want that at all, leaving his men ready to fight. But the other threatened to take his daughter. Then it was on, the father said this was his last chance to step back, but the man just drew a curved blade, as he would have to kill everyone and see what he wanted to look at. And at that moment, everyone started to come forward, while he said that 20 years ago people would quickly flee upon seeing someone in black, and everyone who was in front was thrown. Still, the guys didn't give up and wanted to protect the chief emissary, but they were all cut in half. However, when the masked man looked, the leader was gone from there, and the rest came up strong. But he was cutting, thinking they let their guard down because they had the item that person was looking for. In this case, it must be in the hands of the fleeing emissary, which meant it was okay to kill everyone there. While the fugitive ran, the other men said they would go back and help, but they actually couldn't do that because there was no time, since he couldn't die there because of that thing, something that couldn't fall into the hands of the masked ones. And so, everyone ran with all their might without stopping. His daughter said she couldn't run anymore, but they couldn't stop, as that guy must be exceptional in movement. Until at that moment, the guy with the eyebrow said there were some suspicious people just ahead. And then the chief started sweating, thinking they were surrounded, so he ordered the men to prepare for battle, because he fled to protect the Eight Pearl Bell, and so he couldn't be caught. He needed to inform the Nine Great Sects that the Yumion cult had been reborn so that the nightmare that happened 20 years ago would not happen again. He needed to do what was necessary to survive. And when they looked further ahead, there was a group around the fire that wasn't dressed in black. So it seemed like the heavens hadn't abandoned them. Then it shows three days ago, at the Five Peaks Fortress, Jeek asked why the hell he had to wear that. As the old man spoke about traveling in a large group attracting suspicion, he said they had no choice but to pass through several villages until they reached Mansipion. Among these places, they needed to pass through Hafei, where the Namgon clan resides. It wouldn't bode well to stir trouble there, as it's one of the nine major clans, home to Namgon Bayuk, the Sword King, who, for those who don't recall, was a close friend of the protagonist's father who visited them. The old man continued, saying they might have to fight if they encounter orthodox factions. The chief complained about wearing these clothes because he was afraid. Perhaps he forgot they are from the Five Peaks Fortress and are recognized by the Green Forest. Clearly understanding this, they were anxious because Namgon Bayak is one of Murum's top martial masters. Just then, the girls arrived, agreeing to dress nicely since they look like a wealthy family. The chief himself said the outfit suited him well. In that moment, Jeek appeared, asking if he had put on the right thing, as he had never worn something so complicated before. 
Seeing him, the girls blushed because our scarlet boy looked handsome. They even joked that unlike poor Cholson, he looked great. Anyway, the eldest brother asked them to take good care of the fortress while they were away, as they would cause a stir at that conference. Their old friends remained focused on protecting the fortress. The old man emphasized they couldn't let their guard down, as the reason for the attire was not just to avoid conflict. The reason the mercantile union is submissive is because of the ten heroes of the five peaks. Well, technically just Jeek, right? However, if they find out the heroes will be away for three months, they might take advantage and attack the fortress. Since their faces are recognized, dressing this way provides a disguise. Even the chief doubted anyone would recognize them. Returning to that night, the chief introduced himself as a disciple of the Flying Dragon sect. The other man introduced himself as Jang Hanyang, the chief emissary of the Suwo Mercantile Union. Since they were heading in the same direction, the man suggested they travel together. The chief tried to play it off that they weren't heading the same way, but they hadn't even said where they were going yet. Then the old man from the back said that even if they were on the same path, there was no need to be companions since they had a destination they must reach within a certain time. But Jang, sensing their energy, realized these guys were different, especially the one with red hair. Since it's only a matter of time until that guy arrives, and his warriors are exhausted, they need help. He apologized and said they needed strength at this moment and that if they helped, he was willing to pay generously. After a while, we were by the campfire with the old man complaining that they had turned down the offer with so much money. But according to the chief, the offer was tempting, yet nothing comes for free in this world. That's why it's strange to receive so much money from merchants, especially when they were asking to take care of a strange item. So, it was a good choice to refuse it. The people were still indignant because it was too good an offer to pass up, since they were heading in the same direction and only wanted protection. And now that the decision was made, the second brother said they would at least avoid trouble and focus on the conference. If that's the case, they need to leave now because those guys had been attacked and what's chasing them will arrive here soon. So, everyone went to get their things. Chaeyun went to get the suitcase that was under the tree, while Cholson wondered if he could get there and get it for her, creating a warm atmosphere. But at that moment, an assassin came from above, and just as he was about to grab her, Cholson rushed out and threw himself in front of the sword, taking a deep cut. The masked man said he would kill them all, but at that moment, a red blur landed a heavy blow to the thug's face, sending him flying. While everyone went to check on Cholson, who was severely injured from the deep wound, the chief asked which was the nearest village because he was in danger of dying. When they looked back, it was full of masked men surrounding Jeek through the trees. Then the chief fled, telling two to stay and help Jeek. Our scarlet boy told everyone to keep going because he's more than enough to handle this crowd. And so, everyone ran to the village, trusting Jeek to defeat those people. According to the old man, it's going to be very troublesome because they subdued Cholson with just one attack, which means they are strong. But now they have to trust Jeek. The guys were coming up in droves, and Jeek dodged asking who they are. Since no one spoke, he punched the first one in the head and went for it, kicking everyone around. The guys already realized he's not a normal kid, so they're forming up. But Jeek just wants to know who they are, and since no one is answering, he's going to have to beat them all up. That's how everyone came up. But at this point, let's return to the group that was running to the village. The old man smelled blood and told everyone to stop in silence because they had also reached the Suo Mercantile Union, right there ahead, and they need to pass through here if they want to reach the village. The masked men had already beaten Jang down and were saying that this item is more important than these lives. If he doesn't spill the beans, they'll slit his daughter's throat. Jang knew the masked men would kill everyone even if he talked, and if that's the case, he'd rather die. The masked man then said he would kill more and more people until he tells them where the item is. Probably, the guy had hidden the item very well since he was carrying it with him at that moment. Unless he hid it in the middle of the forest, then it would make sense, because otherwise, it's right up his ass. Then the guy says there's no way he can escape if his daughter is a hostage, so let's spice things up. But at that moment, a voice came that made the masked man tremble because they hadn't brought the item to him yet. And so, everyone greeted the great demonic general, the demon of divine illusion, Wong. Meanwhile, the old man on top of the mountain had no idea who these people were. Because the ambushers were already strong, but these ones with strange weapons have an even more dangerous aura. Besides, that stranger is as strong as the others. Then the second brother came saying, shut up, boy, or you'll screw everything up. Because if the old man is right, they could be more dangerous than anything they've faced before. And despite knowing many factions, these guys have a supernatural energy he's never seen before. 
So, if they make a wrong move from now on, they'll be dead. Down below, the chief's men arrived cutting through the masked men around, saying they'll rescue the young lady. Then, the guys went up and that crazy stranger lit up something and threw it among them, and everyone started sinking into the ground until there was nothing left, because this madman wants to know where the item is. Then, back to Jeek, another one came at him and he attacked fiercely, while the crazy guy told everyone to attack together to defeat this boy. But Jeek, angry, approached and passed through everyone, using the first rising dragon form, defeating all the masked men there. Then, he was thinking, right? Because everyone is strong, and if there are more here, it's going to be a problem for the people. And so, Jeek ran to catch up with the rest of the group, thinking that if they dare to mess with his family, he will cut everyone down with his sword. And with the group, they're trying to stop the bleeding, and the chief asks what those two are staring at. Until the chubby guy comes saying there's no other way, and if they make a big detour, Jeek might lose track of them. So, the chief went to take a look with the others, and according to the old man, those guys are very strong, so it would be better to avoid them. Down below, the stranger will ask once again where the item is, but Jang, not wanting to give in, just says to kill him already. And as he acts like this, the thick-headed one realizes he might know how the 8-bead bell is used, since the cult had gotten rid of anyone who knew about it. However, he wants to know how much he can endure, because he will order his subordinates to play with his daughter right there, since he has a total of 25 subordinates to play around with. As soon as he ordered to start, he shouted that he would hand over the item, but to leave his daughter alone. And so, the other guy who was with him brought the item that was well hidden, right? And how it came to this, if they get the bell, these demons will become even more powerful and the nightmare from 20 years ago will happen again. But, as there's no other way, he starts handing over the item. Just by seeing that, the thick-headed one says you can feel the divine energy of this item. But in the same way, he must pay for causing so much trouble. So, he orders the Black Shadow Squad to clean up everything and satisfy themselves. Hearing this, Jang shouted because he handed over the item and yet the guy is going to do something like this. Aren't you afraid of heavenly punishment? And the stone guy says he is the heavens and since she's going to die, let his subordinates have a little fun. At that moment, a voice came calling them shit fuckers, because he has no pride as a martial artist, as he should never meddle with someone's family. Thus, he descends, saying he's one of the Five Peaks heroes, oops, wrong character. A disciple of the flying dragon sect who will defeat them. Since there were more hidden rats, the thick-headed one sent his people forward, but the chief arrived with respect, cutting down the first one. Seeing that the guy was strong, more people came at him. But from above, Cha Yun was shooting arrows at the people. And how the situation reached this point, everyone is going down to help, as there is no other way. Therefore, they left the other one to take care of Chulson, and everyone went down to fight against the masked men. That's how the fight began. The second brother came in swinging his sword at the guys, but at that moment, another one came up from behind. Luckily, the old man arrived with a kick, saying these guys are strong, so when attacking, make sure to put in full force. According to the old man, this is a battle without a chance of victory, and they will manage to hold out for at least 15 minutes, but if they slip up at any moment, they could die. The other archer guy was wrecking the guys with arrows and he was all powerful, but a surprise attack was coming. At that moment, Chai arrived saving him, telling him not to let his guard down. A guy came at Jang. Then the chief appeared in front, asking if he was indeed the chief emissary and if there was anyone in his group with medical knowledge. Meanwhile, the battle was in full swing, one attacked and the other fell, because these guys' martial arts were very different and powerful. The smart ones came around the bald guy and the old man, but only a sword was thrown into the battlefield because the chief was arriving with a punch. The guy came at him, contesting strength, was thrown back, and took a solid punch to the head. The old man, thinking that this kind of strength might be an innate talent that managed to emerge thanks to Jeek's presence, said thankfully there was a doctor among the group, and he asked them to take Chulson to be healed. He apologized to everyone because he tried to forget and live his life, but he remembered his sword and the children he left behind. And, as a father with children, he cannot let such atrocity pass. So, he only asks that others risk their lives with him. Everyone was joking happily, teasing him that he never mentioned he was married. And, as they are all family, they will live and die together. But Chayun arrived in the middle, saying no one is going to die, as long as they hold on, their guardian angel is coming. So, everyone fought with all their might, while the thick-headed one asked if he would have to personally get involved to deal with insects. But the masked man with the circular blade said none of that, because he craves blood. In the battle, the old man was cutting down the crazy one, while another masked man asked when the combat squad would arrive. In fact, the guy who went to check the situation reported that they had all been annihilated. They wondered if these were the guys, because they don't seem that strong, as the combat squad is composed of elite trained to destroy the nine major sections. But at that moment, the crazy guy arrived, saying this is pathetic, them being humiliated in front of the general. 
So, he started cutting down his own men, because it's time for him to join this game. The chief, angry, asked how he dared to do such a thing to his men and went after him. The sadist thought killing the strongest first would be too boring, so he just dodged and caught Che's arrow in the air, with her saying this time they have the advantage. Then, he came at them, breaking her sword and landing a punch in the stomach. The other archer tried to help, but he threw that crazy sword at him. The chief came, but he dodged, saying he's so slow he can't reach him, and came with the sword toward his head. But the second brother arrived saving the day, albeit not for long, as he soon took a kick to the head. The other was cut at the waist, and even our chubby guy didn't escape, with the happy guy saying they are nothing but weaklings. The old man just threw the sword away, saying he's had enough, because he is the strongest of all, the Gummel Sword of the North. So, he came forward, while the guy dodged everything, saying he's truly the strongest, but that's nothing. He threw the old man away, saying he's good because that attack was meant to cut him in half. Then, the guy came all sadistic, asking if he regrets his actions, as everyone is going to die. But regret is bullshit, because now he won't see that smirk on his face anymore. At that moment, the guy himself trembled, as a terrifying energy was coming from above. He asked if that's why they're feeling content. When Jeek arrived, everyone was happy, thinking victory was theirs. Even though happy, the second brother wondered if he would be able to defeat them all. Thick-headed thought that even in such a situation, they seemed more relaxed, meaning everyone trusts that boy. The other one said the cult's name would be tarnished if they were defeated so easily. But Jeek descended confidently, asking if it was him who hurt his family. The guy came with that strange sword, saying he needs to learn a lesson, but only took a hit to the hand, breaking the bone, and received a violent punch. In the midst of the skirmish, he remembered the general was watching. So, he stood up again not to embarrass himself and eagerly went forward. Jeek raised his hand because now he will pay the price. In the clash of swords, Jeek disarmed him with one hand, and as they exchanged blows, thick-headed arrived, saying he's no match to fight against the boy and defending from the attack, surprised by this strength, as he was pushed back. And here came Jeek again, slashing from above. He dodged, leaping, and drew that crazy weapon because he's worthy to face his soul destruction art, throwing those two things around Jeek. The old man told him to get away from there, as he had seen before what happened, but it was too late. The skill activated, and Jeek began to be engulfed, while the crazy guy thought that after being hit by the general's technique, no one returned alive. Inside this thing, our scarlet boy couldn't breathe. It was very strange, he couldn't cut or do anything, because in the days when General Wu was active, no one could even withstand his technique, and art responsible for imprisoning the enemy's shadow and extracting their soul. When he became one of the 12 demon generals, people used to say he was unmatched, but now he is many times stronger than in the past. Anyone hit by this technique is unable to see anything. For the first time, Jeek found himself in a hopeless situation, losing his senses. He remembered when he was with the old man, he used to say that people used powerful techniques, so having strong martial power alone isn't enough to survive. Even someone strong like him could suffer from these techniques, so Jeek should be careful since he lacks experience. Thinking about it, he asked what he should do if he fell into one of them, and the old man said it depends on what he encounters. However, they usually make some preparation before casting the spell, so if he gets caught by the spell, as long as he destroys what caused it, he will be able to break the technique. He remembered that four objects were stuck around him, meaning that strange gas that came out must be the root of this spell. In other words, those rods are the problem. So he used the first form, Dragon's Claw rends the earth, in all directions. Doing so, he finally cut through everything around, saying that this technique is really annoying. Seeing this, the general got scared because Jeek broke his secret technique, which no one had ever managed, and thus he was already in deep trouble. Everyone was surprised because this had never happened before. Jeek said he's a good wizard, but now he's going to pay back that bastard. Sweating bullets, he asked if the squadron would just stand by, and even the other guy was perplexed because how could they do anything if he couldn't. But anyway, they had to obey because he's their superior. And even though everyone came forward, they were getting cut. While the crazy one thought that even if he fought with everything, he wasn't sure he would win against him, he realized that the priority now was to take the bell. It wasn't because he was afraid, but because they needed at least to kill the merchant chief, since he knew about the cult. So, he grabbed one of those things, jumped up, and said he would take the bell ahead, as this was the highest priority. Since this was the last one, he threw it at the merchant chief, hitting him squarely in the chest. Jeek went after the guys with the Nine Heavens art, Whirlwind of the Nine Dragons, 
That day, the supreme technique of the nine celestial swords, thought lost for many years, reappeared displaying even more power than 20 years ago. With this powerful martial skill, the Shadow Black Squadron was mercilessly devastated. Even their captain fled alongside the general, who was still in shock from being humiliated by a young kid. Jeek was furious, but didn't go after them because his family had suffered many injuries. Even though he saved everyone, he blamed himself for not arriving faster, as he had never received love from his family since he was young. He only received threats and abuse. He endured all of this until he met his new family, the most precious people who are always by his side. Even wounded, Zhang thanked for the help and promised to reward everyone for saving his life. Moreover, he wanted to ask for one more favor, to protect them until they safely reached their destination. Thus, Chief Zhang passed away after being struck by the attack. The heroes of the Five Peaks decided to fulfill his final request, not just because of fate, but because they were severely injured and receiving medical treatment. There was another reason as well. Later, it showed a snowy and secluded corner. That shameless one who fled sneaks in, while someone said he arrived later than expected and that was very disrespectful. With his head down, he apologized because the situation got complicated. Then, the woman told him not to be late from now on because it's rare for the cult generals to gather in one place like today. He apologized again as she asked if he brought the bell. Even though it was a complicated mission, he brought it, and with that, the cult now possessed seven out of eight bells. She thanked him, saying it was good work. The others were there, discussing that, since they have everyone's approval, they decided on the next candidate for general. In addition, they have seven lords in the cult. At this moment, another asks if there's a need to have seven lords, as it could be just six. Another agrees too, but it would be a waste not to use one of the bells at the Soul Invocation Festival. The guy on the left was already fed up, they agreed before and now they're arguing like beasts again. The one in the center said they're playing around and since the cult leader is far away, they don't need to rush. But as soon as the seven lords are gathered, they'll have to use the bells to increase the number of demonic soldiers. And that will also be when the Yumiung cult will appear in Jianghan again. So, once they gather the lords, they will be able to dominate the entire Murim world. That cowardly bastard said it won't be so easy. He lost half of the Shadow Black Squadron on his mission to an unknown brat. Even the captain, one of the twelve soldiers, was defeated with a single blow. And as he's a sorcerer, he was confident he could face our Scarlet Boy, but in the end, that brat was a monster. He was able to destroy his soul art alone, which we know scared him shitless and made him run away. The woman said that's nonsense unless he's one of the ten strongest martial masters, a general can't lose to him. Then he started sweating bullets, saying since his mission was to bring the artifact, he immediately left the fight. But honestly, he doesn't think he would have won that fight because he's never seen martial arts like that. Since after he spun in the sky nine times, the energy of the blade came down like lightning. And then the woman turned paler than white, asking how he said spin nine times. But after that, we're on Palgong Mountain, where you'll visit if you don't leave a like down there. So, buddy, want to visit Palgong? A guy up there shouted how dare they sneak onto his mountain like rats. This guy was the leader of the Crimson Death Fortress, the Celestial Blood Axe Rio. He continued, saying that his fortress commanded those mountains and that if they wanted to pass through alive, they should pay 200 per person. The leader was already there, saying it was too expensive and that they would pay a maximum of 20. The old man was already warning that they would come to cause trouble, but he had to offer help to the mercantile union. In the end, they were screwed to get to the great conference of the green forest. The woman said they couldn't pay that much because they were ambushed. The guy realized they didn't even have a carriage. The woman continued, I would like to implore the compassion of the heroes of the Crimson Death Fortress to let us pass. But the guy was already angry, saying he was in a hurry because a big event was happening and ordered them to give everything they had. She tried to explain that they had already been robbed, but he said he would have to cut everyone into slices and sell the meat if that was the case. The other said that usually things tend to appear after shaking people a bit. This was the vice chief of the fortress. The leader was saying, I think we have to pay them at least something, right? While all this confusion was happening, another girl came up to Jeek, saying, it was that man over there holding the axe. That one has a face that looks like a bitten dumpling, but actually looks like one infested with fungi because of his beard, and everyone was laughing while the leader was saying he didn't want to give them money but should think about what would happen if they angered Jeek, because he would end up breaking everyone in a fight. The guys up there thought the people were crazy to get into such a situation. The vice chief asked if it seemed like a joke to them because he wasn't blind and ordered everyone to look at the pile of gold in the old man's hand. So he was already there, you lied to the fortress, and because of that, the vice chief drew his sword, asking if they were mocking him. Because if they didn't realize the situation, they were screwed. He said, hey, you woman there, what's so funny? What are you laughing at? And he already shouted, 
you are idiots who can't even realize the situation you're in. I'm in charge here, and now you won't have any more luck on your way. But at that moment, when he was all defiant, a coin flew and hit the scoundrel's head. The old man asked when all the gold in the bag disappeared while the guy was thrown far into the tree. The other with the big beard asked what was happening, he didn't even feel the attack, and it was over. The old man there said it was all screwed up because Jeek was shaking the coins, saying that the man disfigured by fungi was very rude and no matter what he says, now he should never have messed with his family because our Jeek Torito is here. And then he started throwing coins at the extra's head and also at everyone around there. The leader was already telling everyone to hide their faces because you never know if they will remember this later at the Great Green Forest Conference. At this moment, the other one said it was too late because now that Jeek attacked them, they will never forget this group. Then he spoke about the Crimson Death Fortress. They loot groups traveling through the mountains and with that, they could leave a good impression at the Great Green Forest Conference. Even though it wasn't a quick method, they were accumulating quite a lot of money. Until they met the Scarlet Boy and irritated his patience. And so, all the main members of the fortress were incapacitated from fighting well before the conference. It was a complete defeat for their side. Then we returned to the cult, and that woman was saying this was ridiculous. Unless he was a martial master, there would be no way. But the guy still talked about that martial art he had never seen before. When he said that, she mentioned it reminded her of a certain someone, but she had heard he had passed away. After all, it's rare for someone to be able to use such an advanced skill like his. So she asked if he said it was a child because if that guy was alive, he would be around 50 years old by now. But no, he said the boy should be around 20 years old. No, he seemed to be 15 years old. He has red hair and behaves like an orthodox martial artist. And then the woman thought that there was a high chance he was the son of that guy she met many years ago. Over 20 years ago, there was a temple that was built under the name of their leader in Jangu. At that time, the guy who went there with the young patriarch of the Nangu clan and destroyed everything with his dragon martial arts. And that arrogant scoundrel earned the nickname Moonbreaker Swordsman after that, which still irritates her every time she thinks about it. She was one of the 12 demonic soldiers at that time but now has the power of a great general. Therefore, the day the cult enters Jangu will be the day she avenges the humiliation she suffered. Then we return to the people from the Five Peaks Fortress. The leader was saying they couldn't go around picking fights with everyone, while the others were arguing about who started the fight first, and the girl saying that Jeek is the best. Then it showed the neighboring village of Mansipyong. The people were thinking about what just happened because it was a big enough incident to leave all the villagers in shock. As the day of the Great Green Forest Conference is near, the villages were filled with countless bandits from the fortresses. Fortunately, because the Green Forest bandits were keeping each other in check, no turmoil was caused among the people. Then it showed a guy telling the old man that all the bandits from the Central Plains are here, and this was already expected since they are talking about the largest organization in Muram's history, the Green Forest. Others were saying there was a group that looked like a bunch of idiots and wondered if you need appearance to be chosen for the Green Forest. And who were they talking about? Of course, about the group of our handsome Scarlet Boy. The guy said these fellows are just here to meet the required number of members and that maybe one punch would be enough to take each one down. But then you think, right, guys, one sword from Jeek and that big-eared guy was already on the ground. But another guy told him to avoid fighting that red-haired kid at all costs. The big-eared one asked, that kid? And also not to underestimate the beggar's sect, or he would end up on the wrong side of the wrong people and live worse than in hell. Then night fell and we are in Mansipion. A group was in some tents, saying that now that they've seen all the fortresses gathered, their union seems increasingly powerful. The leader told them to stop talking nonsense and unpack quickly, already calling the other because, since they came here, they should show respect to the lords of the fortresses. The bald guy, tired, said they would meet them later anyway, so there was no need to do it now. This way, the moon was shining while Jeek lay on the grass looking at the sky. The woman arrived, saying she finally found him and asked how he could be lying there like that. He said he just came there to organize his thoughts, as he had been thinking about many things recently. Jeek even asked if she had fought with Cha these days since she was always with her, but she said no. The reason is that she has been with Chu San a lot recently, so she feels like she is in the way if she is with them. Jeek asked if in that case, she didn't want to stay there with him. She sat down, saying she thought Jeek had no worries in life since he is very strong. Actually, he was trying to remember his parents, but he couldn't remember either of their faces because his mother died after giving birth to him. As for his father, he had never seen him until he was six years old and, in fact, it would be strange if he remembered the old man's face. But he only remembers the people he hated so much because these were the ones who tried to send Jeek to his death. 
She asked if he was talking about the time when he was six years old and what kind of danger a boy that age would face. She was already angry, asking if those people who mistreated him were still alive because they needed to take revenge immediately. But Jeek said they couldn't do that because that person is his aunt. Then, while Jeek told his story at the Warong mansion, so Beck was unable to say anything to him. She thought that Jeek had his own past, as everyone had one or two sad stories in life. But because this boy, who seemed younger than her, had been able to overcome all the threats and problems, she thought his past couldn't have been that terrible. This is the scarlet boy whom everyone envies, but he, in fact, also suffered a lot in life. So she was crying, apologizing because she didn't know all those things had happened to him. Jeek was stunned, not knowing what to do. Later, he said that, based on the green forest rules, fortresses should not get in the way of other fortresses, but those guys who helped the mercantile union attacked them. And here we find that bearded guy with broken teeth, saying they disguised themselves as the mercantile union's escorts. They are actually members of the green forest, from the Five Peaks Fortress. So, he said it wasn't right to let a fortress that broke the rules go unpunished like that. That's why he requested a meeting with the green forest boss, and that's why he was there. He asked if the Five Peaks Fortress was created recently because if that's the case, it means that the Crimson Death Fortress is showing such incompetence to lose to a fortress like that. This guy is none other than the Supreme Commander of the Green Forest, the sky-destroying Demon Lord. Then, the guy apologized, asking what he had inquired about. Among those watching was that scoundrel who had ended up visiting the Five Peaks Fortress, one of the twelve demonic generals, the Sovereign Wind. He thought that it was probably the same rascal who beat him and attacked the Crimson Death Fortress, someone who didn't even respect his superiors. The leader looked at him with a stern face and told him to leave. He then asked the generals if the skilled swordsman came from the Five Peaks Fortress because he remembers this rumor he heard well. The Sovereign Wind said that he doesn't even seem to be in his twenties, and for a young man, he is very skilled. He then put his hand to the side and asked, Are you telling me that the disciple of the sky-destroying demon lord was defeated by a kid who isn't even 20 years old? He apologized, saying he drank too much, but he slammed the table because he decided that this child from the Five Peaks Fortress would be coming to the Grand Conference. And if he comes, then he, the Sovereign Wind, will take action. And he asked, How about it, sir? All this because he said he made a mistake when he was drunk because it's unacceptable for a disciple of the demon lord to be defeated by a mere child who isn't even 20 years old. And if he loses to that brat again at the conference, he will be forced to give up his place among the 12 generals and train in isolation for another 10 years. Then he remembered all the suffering he had to endure. The boss wants me to spend another 10 years in that hell. He continued shouting there, what's the problem? Are you afraid of that brat? Come on, while he trembled all over. So he quickly said yes sir, because he would follow the orders. But in the end, we know he's screwed because he won't manage alone. So, he needs to find another solution. Then, elsewhere, the leader was already there, all happy. Oh, who could it be? Isn't it our brother, Sovereign Wind? And he asked what brought him there. He arrived there, happy to say that the Five Peaks Fortress had arrived. But the leader just hugged him, calling him to join the party. And everyone was there kneeling, asking how he had been. Meanwhile, he was upset, saying that, brother, your mother, because if he hadn't made that mistake at the Five Peaks Fortress, those scoundrels wouldn't be like that. They told him to sit at the table, but at that moment he saw our two women from the fortress, and in his memory, he felt all healed, saying that the reason he had sought them that night was to ensure that there would be no flaws in the schedule of the Grand Conference of the Green Forest, which would take place over the next three days. So, he asked the Five Peaks Fortress to provide a list of those who would be participating. But the leader was smiling, saying, why would you ask for something like that when you already know who they're going to send? Obviously, everyone looked to the side and there was our boy Jeek, asking what kind of mess they were making in the middle of the meal. He was thinking that this guy is arrogant, and even if he can't defeat this brat in battle, he just has to make sure he doesn't participate in the Grand Conference. Then, the Great Chief of the Green Forest shouted that they were not just a group of bandits. They were going to surpass the nine great sects and become the greatest sect in the Murim world, and no one from the Orthodox sects would be able to look down on the bandits again. So, he ordered everyone from the Green Forest to prepare for the 1000-year reign because the Grand Conference of the Green Forest begins now. Everyone shouted yeah, as the secret competition among the greatest bandits started to decide a total of 10 guards and patrols. The first day of the Grand Conference of the Green Forest began. People in the middle of the crowd were fighting, asking, why are you pushing me, and a fight broke out immediately. The bald guy told his brother that they should at least compete in one of the categories of the Green Forest competition, because it would look bad for them if they left everything to Jeek. Then, in the middle of the circle, one of the guards shouted, Does anyone wish to compete in the first category of the Grand Green Forest? At that moment, people flew in from all directions wanting to compete. One introduced himself as Linning, the chief of Yongma Mountain. 
The other was Marjeep, the chief of Bong Mountain. The crowd was excited for the fights to begin. The first came with the Divine Massacre Sword and he defended with the Flying Dragon Dance. It was a fierce fight. Another grabbed his opponent's head with chains and spun him through the air. Meanwhile, someone else appeared saying, Assassin Ghost would also like a lesson from you. I am called Jaguar Slayer and I also want to fight you. And then it was a fight with punches, kicks, and slaps while the guys up top thought it looked more like a street dog fight than anything else. That one was the Phantom Monarch, one of the 12 generals of the Green Forest. At the same time, he looked at the Sovereign Wind, saying he was looking forward to seeing his fight down below because, seeing how drunk he was now, he must have learned some new technique. So, he already had a secret technique, which should be called that. And all this was because, the night before, he came to the tent asking who was going to compete in the Grand Conference. And, of course, that person would be Arjeek. So, he said, wait, wait. He knows very well what his abilities are. Then he said that this is not just a martial arts competition, it is a place where they will be selecting important people for the Green Forest. And if our Scarlet Boy shows up in this competition, he will be able to secure the position of guard, that's for sure. But the problem is what comes next. The position requires patrolling, which means that when this competition is over, he won't be able to return to the Five Peaks Fortress. And, of course, that's right because a position in the Green Forest is not easy. That's why he said that, for sure, the young ones will go through many hardships, and this may take one or several years. And not just that, without the ten heroes of the Five Peaks, the fortress won't survive for long. Or, if all the brothers return, Jeek will have to fulfill his obligations to the forest. He even frowned, asking if that means he will have to be alone, without his family. Our brothers already realized, that's why this scumbag came here, this open-mouthed snake. But, despite all this, everything he said is true within the green forest. Then, Jeek squeezed the chopsticks, saying that if that's the chief's decision, he will follow it calmly. But even so, he was sad about it because he finally had a real family to take care of. And if he becomes a guard, they will have to part ways for a while. But the leader shouted, Jeek hasn't even become a guard yet, why is everyone assuming that? And he came over all smiling, saying that since when do the heroes of the Five Peaks have any interest in becoming guards, they won't be stuck in these boring things. Then Jeek smiled, saying that's right. Even though his brother said that, he still feels regret for Jeek. So, our drunkard was there, drinking because his secret technique went straight to their hearts. So he was enjoying his sweet drink, while the cult leader watched all that circus down there, thinking about the brat from the Five Peaks, Jeek. We return to the fighting session. The guy gave a mega headbutt to the other, which made him receive all the glory with the iron head art. And the brother was thinking, but that wasn't just a headbutt. As Jeek started to move, the brother asked where he was going. He said he tried to watch as everyone said, but he was going there to take a leak. Then he leaped off the wall, and the other still asked, but why are you going to pee with your sword? But the old man said he's sure he's just going to beat up some trees in the forest, there's nothing more to do there, because this competition for Jeek is like child's play. Meanwhile, everyone was talking about how monstrous Jeek's strength was. Our yellow-dressed girl was saying, don't be mean, Jeek is not a monster. And everyone stopped to look at her angrily. But at the same time, people were already there, betting, I bet on the passionate bald guy. And she was thinking that they always say the same thing, that Jeek is a monster or a martial arts master, and that's why she gets more and more anxious if she will be able to stand by his side as an equal. Then, as soon as Jeek left the Grand Conference, the significant event began to unfold on the battlefield, as if to say that everyone was waiting for him to leave. Everyone in the audience watched this fight, until one of them moved, coming with the sword up. The other crossed swords with him and cut from the same side. It was an insane fight. The audience roared, saying their chief is the best, and those who were speaking were from the Ebo fortress. Meanwhile, the brothers said that the fights are starting to get somewhat decent now, as those are the brothers from the major fortress. But for the old man, this is nonsense. This fight is already becoming catastrophic due to the power of the two, as the crazy guy who is about to lose is the direct disciple of the demonic lord who devastates the skies, one of the twelve generals, the Axis of Red Eyes. And he himself was up there, asking if that man isn't Lemon from the Ebio Fortress, because he is stronger than he appears. And then everyone around could see that he was getting furious with this fight. The hothead down there took a deep breath, saying that the chief of the Ebio Fortress is certainly a good opponent, but he won't just stand there because it's getting boring. So he raised his strength because he will finish this fight with one strike. And at that moment, a purple energy began to surround his strength, because this is the blood snake's attack, and it was a snake's art against the other fortress leader. The brother looked into the audience, thinking that there were many snakes coming at him, while others told him to watch out for the snakes. But in the end, this seems to be the end for the chief of the Ebo fortress. 
The snake came all at once, hitting him from all sides. Meanwhile, the old man was thinking that the chief of the fortress was able to make one of the Lord's disciples use his final technique in a duel. And because of these skills, his name will be known, although his level doesn't even come close to our monster Jeek. The bald guy jumped up and came down hard, while Jeek was there taking a leak, looking up and saying he came here to train, but it seems it's going to pour. Then he walked over, saying, whatever. He leaned against a tree, saying he'll use it as his umbrella for today. Then he threw the sword up and prepared himself, thinking that the people from the fortress aren't here, so there's no need for him to be excessive. So he will use his speed at minimum to cut this tree down. Just then, someone up there complained that Jeek wanted to cut him along with that tree. At that moment, Jeek tried to stop but only made a crack in the tree. The woman up there stood up, asking if she should thank him for sparing her life or should she beat him for messing up her tree like that. Jeek looked startled because he didn't sense anyone around, while asking if he shouldn't be in the arena. But she, standing in front, said it's like him because she doesn't care about this green forest thing or whatever. She came to the forest to take a nap and almost fell headfirst because of this fortress chief. Then Jeek left, saying, oh, I'm not the chief, bye. While she came running, asking if there's anyone stronger than him in the fortress, because his skills seem to be very high. He said, oh, my chief has something that cannot be expressed through martial arts, maybe a good heart, right guys? Because he's not that strong, really. But at that moment, Jeek turned with a grimace, asking why the heck this woman is following him. And there he was, blinking, saying that this conference is full of middle-aged men and she's just trying to make friends, since they are young mountain bandits who happen to meet by chance. And Jeek there, asking what the heck she's talking about, if she's drunk in the middle of the day. But she looked at him, saying he's a bit naive, because when someone says they want to make friends, there's only one thing that means. And then she tossed a leaf at Jeek, because that means a battle. He came kicking and grabbing his sword, asking if this is how she makes friends, because if so, our Scarlet Boy will welcome it with open arms. Even though he was somewhat disappointed because he would like to fight someone who has the ability to cut a person with a leaf, since what she sent along with that leaf was a toothpick, she said, oh, I was just taking a nap, why are you talking nonsense like that? For things like cutting with a leaf, he'll have to try asking one of the elders from the five major orthodox sections. She jumped up because she was going to show her rusty pedal barrier. Jeek came defending, saying he has already found someone who can do that. Then he jumped towards all the leaves with hidden weapons and spun his sword, cutting everything. And at the same time, he descended with her in the sky, because it seems she's nowhere near being able to do that. She looked amazed because she recognizes that he's fast, but he managed to break her trap in a second. And then we're back to the battle that was happening there in the arena. The people cheered as expected from one of the twelve generals, and the bald guy himself spoke confidently, I apologize for taking so long in this fight, master. But at that moment, the man realized something. The chief of the fortress was still standing. He told the bald guy to focus because the duel wasn't over yet. And just as he glanced sideways, the guy was insane, like a spider coming up. Because if he couldn't defeat him with that attack, now he's screwed, since the chief of the fortress is using his final technique of the poisonous insect goo. And then he went after the bald guy, who was jumping through the air, but he overcame his attack and kept coming with his insect claws, because that was a great fight, general. At that moment, the spider stomped on the bald guy's head, throwing him away. Then the guy put his hands up thanking him for the fight. The lord looked down from above, asking what kind of energy this is. The old man spoke in the middle of the crowd that fortunately the attacks missed vital points, so the crazy guy must still be alive. But that guy used a cultivation technique that even the old man had never seen before. So he wondered there on the side, what's going on at the great conference of the green forest? At night, the lord clapped his hands while passing energy to the bald guy, who had taken a beating and was incapacitated. He thanked his master, saying he's ashamed of himself for losing this fight. He asked why the master did it personally, but it's because his disciples seem to lack the energy to use their fights properly. And then he added more, saying that's not all, there was something he wanted to confirm directly in the damaged energy. The bald guy asked if he was suspecting the identity of the chief of the EBO fortress. The bald guy trembled, saying it's kind of embarrassing to say this, but in that martial art there was something mysterious that sent shivers down his spine every time he looked at it. The other one from behind said that for years the EBO fortress has been aligned with them, although they know what the conference means. But for their chief to fight and defeat a disciple in front of everyone, that means it can't be taken lightly. Then the old man asked why, if that's the case, Lemujin must be crazy, getting in the way of the forest representatives. The drunk asked if this meant that the major orthodox sects are behind them, and they argued until the lord sent it enough, because he found something, a mini spider. He picked it up, saying that there's only one group in all of Murim capable of using something as evil as this, the demon cultists. 
So it seems the cult still hasn't been able to rid themselves of their disillusioned dream of conquering Murim. Then, elsewhere at night, the woman in the center was receiving a message. Based on what they received, Lumujin did a great job smashing the direct disciple of the demon lord. She smiled and asked, and the other warriors? The masked man said the remaining four will fight soon, as scheduled. Then it showed a triple blade fortress, and the one in front is the cold blood sword demon. At storm fortress, there's another one, the shadow assassin. At River Dong Fortress, there's the Boar Killer, the Great Blood Devourer. And now, at River Yagzet Fortress, there's the Lazy One, the Young Lone Demon. Then the masked man said these are four of the ten people in charge of patrolling security. The woman laughed, saying it will be more fun than it seems, because it will be a sight to see the twelve demon generals squirming at the feet of the twelve demon warriors. Back to the discussion. The cult is trying to use the Green Forest as a base of attack. The drunk asked if they shouldn't do something immediately, until the lord noticed something and shouted asking where Ryoshi is, one of them said the last time she was seen was in the first half of the duel. He became worried, ordering everyone to go after her, because if they confirmed the plans of the demon cult and she's not here, that would be kind of dangerous. But at this nighttime hour, we return to the tent of the Five Peaks Fortress. The brother was excited because they had a guest, while Jeek asked, why the hell did you follow me here? Then, we're in a drinking room. Jeek asked why it wouldn't be strange if someone died from drinking all this booze, and she said, what would be stranger? Because after a fight between men, there are only two things waiting for them. The first thing is to keep fighting until one of them falls. And the second thing is, but she didn't finish speaking while the others asked why she left them curious and stopped abruptly? One of them said she was waiting for Jeek to ask, so he said, what's the second thing? So she came on strong, asking if he's that curious. And what about it? The second serious thing is sharing your stories while getting drunk, to become brothers. Jeek, aware, said he admits that among the people he's met, she's quite decent, but it's still a bit hard to accept. The two drunkards were there already, saying that as expected, their older brothers should sort this out. They said that despite it being the first meeting, she was quite direct about what she wanted, so they'll welcome her with open arms and a drink. Each of them grabbed a barrel to drink from, while Jeek didn't understand why there was so much excitement. Then Chai called her to sit down, saying the party was about to begin. She said, so your name is Jeek? But at that moment, she winked at Sobek, who was left almost clueless. Then Chai asked Sobek to bring some snacks for the guest. As the drinking began, the old man already sensed something was amiss because the aroma lingering in the air was rich and fragrant. In other words, this wine is incredible. It turned into a wild party with drinks flowing everywhere. The old man, suspicious, later wondered who that crazy person was and how he managed to bring such expensive wine, but he didn't care because it tasted so good. They drank all night. Meanwhile, at the same time, several people were running through the mountains and the lord asking if they had discovered Ryasha's whereabouts. The bearded one apologized because they were still searching, but with many fortresses involved, it would take time to find out. Then, at that moment, the old drunkard arrived saying they found Ryosh because this robot back here said it followed her to the stockpile and gave her the master's wine. In the memory he heard, he asked where she took it, and it seems it ended up at the Five Peaks Fortress, where they are drinking until they drop. Then even the lord stopped to think because he had heard that name many times in recent days. The bearded one said that if the cult spies clashed in the green forest, they might be from the Five Peaks Fortress, then showed them drinking, unaware of the mess that's unfolding. The lord then frowned, asking if he's implying that his only daughter is in the cultist's lair. The old man clapped his hands, telling him not to worry. All the leaders of the green forest are gathered in Mansapyong, so they won't be able to act. Then the lord asked what he thinks they should do. One of the hairy ones said that although it may be a bit difficult, he thinks they should trust the young lady and observe them a bit more, because if rumors spread that the master and the twelve generals are personally involved with the fortress within the conference, the purpose of enhancing the reputation of the green forest will be undermined. The old man wondered what was happening and if those guys were spies, but that would be impossible, the energy they emanate is actually closer to those belonging to the orthodox sections. However, due to the ghost monarch's hasty conclusion, a completely wrong decision was made. Nevertheless, if his misunderstanding runs so deep, at that moment, the lord came asking our drunkard what he wanted to hear, since he had been in contact with these people before. He, all smiles because this was his perfect opportunity, said he agreed with what was said and thought it made total sense, because this way he could get rid of that famous thorn in his side. Then he said, oh, there was something I forgot to mention. He remembered later the things that were said, a chilling energy that goes beyond being monstrous. When he was drunk that day, he remembered the energy Jeek was emanating. Then the other said that if what he said is true, then they should finish them off immediately. A fight broke out because some wanted to calm down while others wanted to start a brawl. 
At that moment, with the Shadow Monarch's slight suspicion, something that should never have been awakened began to stir, the chief's fury, but not as the demon lord, but as a father. He said that while the lord is known to be unparalleled in the world for his strength and spirit, when it comes to his only blood daughter, he is just a father with unconditional love. For him, his daughter's safety is everything in his life, and even if to maintain her safety he has to cause a bloody massacre throughout Murim, he will do it. While all this confusion was happening, Ryoshi was slumping over the table with Jeek, who was still having a drink. Hey, wake up, you failure, get up, you're drinking too much. And at that moment, Jeek felt a strange pressure throughout the green forest. Back at the bearded man, he asked if they shouldn't go after Ryoshi immediately, but the lord called him a fool, because if they did that, they would be doing exactly what they want. He apologized as the lord told him to just ensure his daughter's safety, because if they do nothing to her, he would only be someone who attacked a member of the Green Forest family based on suspicions. And all this is because the cultists are after the Grand Conference of the Green Forest, and from now on, they will likely make even more provocative moves. They will use demonic raids and show their faces, and if they use this power to defeat one of the twelve generals, the reputation of the Green Forest will crumble. If rumors spread that they attacked a Green Fortress based only on suspicions, the fortresses will not trust them, and the authority and solidarity of the Green Forest will be undermined. The most important thing they need to do is to do their best to enhance the reputation of the Green Forest. And so everyone was on edge, because they're going to defeat everyone. The hairy one arrived saying he was worried about one thing, what if the Five Peaks Fortress doesn't participate in the duels? So the drunkard stopped to think because, because of what he said, they won't participate in the duels. Meanwhile, the hairy one said that, judging by their attitude, they're just on a sightseeing trip, whether they win or lose the duel. The people he really suspects are those who advance for positions, but they haven't participated in any duels yet. They approached Miss Ryoshi, who also didn't appear in the arena, so that's very strange. The other realizes his mistake because even if they participate, it's impossible to use demonic arts, so he's screwed because he'll end up getting caught in the lie. The goatee asked if there was anything they could do. Meanwhile, on the other side, the brothers were more drunk than anything. The boss smiled, opening his mouth, saying it's so good to have one of these, and wondered which fortress that guy is from to bring such expensive wine. But just as he passed by, all drunk, there were some scoundrels from that other fortress saying that this way, the plan will go smoothly. So they set off to go after the leader, because at that very moment, an incident is happening that will make our Scarlet Boy enter the scene to see what's going on. In other words, we'll probably see extras getting beaten up. They threw sand in the leader's face, while Jeek wondered if he heard the boss's voice. The other one was there, oh, who said I'm drunk? I don't get drunk easily. Because of that, he thought it was nothing. But meanwhile, they were coming after the leader. He defended the attacks with brute force, but was knocked down. The bearded boss told them not to let their guard down, because they'll be in big trouble if they keep blabbering, and that brat shows up. For now, he's going to smack him over the head to find a quiet place. Then later, Jeek opened the door asking where the hell his brother is. At the same time, the goatee and his henchman were by a stream, dunking his head in the water to see if he'd wake up, until he finally got up. The scoundrels all laughed at his face, because now he looked like a desperate rat. The leader stood up, saying it looks like there's someone kind who left him sober like this, and without a doubt these are the brothers of the Crimson Death Fortress. At that moment, the crazy guy with the mohawk came to kick him in the face, but took a punch and another stronger one, making him fly away, because the leader ended up sober because of these little shits. Then he called out, Hey, chief of the Crimson Fortress, are you doing this just because you got beaten up by one of your brothers? And the other one must still be drunk because, within the hierarchy of the Green Forest, the Five Peaks Fortress was recently recognized. This means that in the ranking, they are at the lowest possible level. So how dare he do that to his fortress, but the boss here doesn't care because if they want to punish someone, they should go directly to those who hit them. So what's their reason for coming after someone innocent in the group like him? He shouted that he's the fortress chief and therefore responsible for that member. In fact, he was already laughing because he's sure they're scared of our scarlet boy. The bearded man said he must have gone mad, but the chief was already grimacing because if he came after him, it means he thinks he's weak. But the chief is putting pressure on them because he's going to make sure to change their perception that he's weak. The crazy one in the back told his leader he has a bad feeling about this, while he shouted, come at me, girls. Their axe chief jumped up and screwed it up because the bum was just bluffing, since here the heart is what's strong. Then he looked at a rock down there and grabbed it, because he's not someone who would lose to useless people. So, he took it and threw it towards the guy behind the Crimson Fortress leader, leaving only one bum. He asked there if he still looked so easy to them. 
because he's going to show what he's really capable of. The chief was there, of course it doesn't seem like there was just a misunderstanding between us, and he already hit his axe, thinking that the Five Peaks Fortress has too many monsters. He said that actually, the reason he brought him here is for something else, meaning our professional rat chief ended up putting an idea in his head so deep that he still believes it. But at that moment, up there, someone thought they were seeing something interesting and he would be too generous to turn a blind eye to this fight. So the bearded man turned around, wondering why he was there, since he's one of the 12 demon generals, the ghost monarch. He asked our leader how he was able to obtain such superhuman strength, and he tried to dismiss the idea, saying it's nothing special, he's just born a bit tougher than others. But he smiled darkly, saying the reason isn't convincing, so he won't ignore the evil energy he's feeling. And right away, he went for him, smashing our leader, folks. In other words, they messed with Jeek's family. So if you want to see the continuation, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and comment on what you thought of the video. See you next time, guys.